it's time for another blast from the past, our own past. We're going to play some Dawn of Man, which I chose for one good reason. I've played so many space sci-fi games recently, I'm like, do I have anything that's not a space sci-fi game? Well, I've gone as far back as I can in a game that still has human characters. It's the Paleolithic era, and it's time to play a quote-unquote city builder, although of course it's not going to be too much of a city. It's going to be a people picking up sticks near some tents simulator in Dawn of Man, where basically your goal is to make, eventually, an Iron Age village that's as far forward in the future as you can get. And along the way, we need to invent all of the stuff. So like the premise is, I guess we've just stopped being a nomadic band, a not very big nomadic band, we've only got seven people, but we've got two tents and we've decided we're just going to stay here. What can we make of ourselves if we just stay here? So we're settling down roots. And as you can see, that mainly involves telling your people to go and pick up sticks and stones from the environment, and we can put together some more tents here. This is essentially what it tells you to do in the tutorial. It's just giving you the basics of the economy. And it's quite good because the tutorial in the end says something like, you'll need to know a lot more than this to play the game, like you'll learn more as you go along, which is a nice salve to a complaint I sometimes have about tutorials on this channel, where the tutorial will say, and now you know everything you need to play the game. And I'm always like, no you don't, don't lie to me tutorial, like there's loads of extra knowledge, like this game would suck if the tutorial was everything you needed to play the game, that's probably true of most games. So stop saying that, game developers. And calm, we're here picking somewhere to start our new village thing. We have various choices about where to go, there are even various choices about different campaign scenarios to play through, but we're just playing through the normal one because that's all that's unlocked in the beginning. You have to pick where on this map you want to start. And I had this vague idea that we should make this decision based on far future geopolitical knowledge. This environment, surrounded by mountains and having these two big rivers in it, basically means the city that's going to win once we get to city-state wars, which isn't in this game, will be the one that's like on the river, furthest down the river. I'm trying to build like Shanghai in an environment that looks kind of like China. We're really thinking far ahead. I'm like, guys, in 15,000 years, this will turn out to be a good spot to have a town. Like if we can get some massive oil tankers up this river, it will prove very useful. Well, the river's not as big as I hope, so I guess not. But you know, let's think about the here and now. We've got a couple of tents. We're surrounded by stones on the ground. Let's drag the stones together into the middle and then think about what to do next. And that's really where our economy is going to begin. Our people will pick up sticks and stones and we can do stuff with them like make sharper sticks. What are we doing? We're kind of like the god of the village. So we have this magical view, I think it's called paleo view or something, where you can see highlighted parts of the environment that are going to be useful to you. So here we've detected that on the other side of the river there are various plants that we might be able to use near to each other so we can set up a harvest zone. The economy of the game is extremely automated, that's what it's all based around. You just point out things your people should do and you leave it up to them whether they'll do it and in what order you'll do the various tasks you've said they should do. You just have a little bit of influence over like how many people will do each task. The lack of control was both really interesting to me, but also sometimes frustrating, so we'll have to get into that as we go along. There you saw me ordering my people to kill a boar that's on the other side of that mountain over there. Now, because we do possess a couple of spears as a village, somebody will probably take one and go to try and hunt the boar at some point. What you can do is select individual people and tell them to do certain things. So while everything is happening automatically, you can override the automation, although you'll also be battling with it at the same time. Well, maybe we'll see some examples. I didn't do that in this case, so we'll look at that another time. What we're doing is we're curing meat on some sticks. We've got a few dead animals around the camp, so I brought those in before I did any hunting in order to get some food. We can also collect various things depending on the season from the nearby environment. and. Managing how the seasons change and how that changes your economic possibilities is going to be a key part of the game. The big thing, of course, being that you'll need food for winter when generally you won't have much food income, and that's where the curing comes in. Everything in the game degrades constantly, including your buildings. So the resources you collect will just go away if you don't use them. 
but with meat, for example, you can cure it to make it last longer. That is, you can, like, dehydrate it loads so the bacteria eat it slower, and then it will last longer in your tents. Here's a measure of how things are going. We have a wellness stat and a prestige stat. The prestige stat is something to do with how big your town can become. Because the way you get new people is you sort of attract them from the wild by being a prestigious village. Your people can also reproduce, although that gives you a negligible amount of extra population as it turns out. We also there complete a milestone. I think that was for killing something. Somebody went and killed a boar and started bringing the meat back. The milestones are essentially the quests of the game. So the actual goal like in-game is to complete the 10 main quests of this scenario. This will unlock other campaigns if you do it, and that was one of them. Here's an example of the storage tent having a health bar. It will gradually fall apart. And this is something that kind of conflicts, I guess, in the long term with the way this game is so chill. Like, it's really automated, and a lot of tasks take a long time. So a lot of the time, you don't really have much to do as the player, and a lot of your duties are essentially watching out for things, like looking to see if an interesting animal has come near the camp and telling your people about it if you see it, or just planning things out in advance. And this is somewhat at odds, I think, kind of vibally with the finiteness of everything. Your village can't be sustainable in this game. Like, it always uses finite resources. I think the closest you come to being sustainable is right now in the beginning, when you're mainly using, like, trees and animals, which do regenerate on the map. But you're still using stone to some extent to make your stone tools. And stones are a finite resource on the map. It's kind of, like, strange because there are so many stones, but only some of them can be picked up. And in particular, you need to collect flint to make a lot of the early tools. And you'll run out of flint, and then it's like, well, our village is doomed, unless you made a certain amount of progress to start switching to a new material. So on the subject of progress, let's look here at the tech tree. We've got loads of old-school techs to work out. We can try and train the local wolves to become dogs or something. We can make bone tools as well, which is the top left tech, and that's probably the one I should have gone for, because a lot of the game progress is sort of stuck behind your ability to make good tools to do stuff. I didn't really think of that at first, so I think the first tech I picked here was leather tanning, thinking, yeah, we'll make something out of leather at some point. There was a tech in the next age which requires you to have leather, the sledging tech. And I, I was thinking logistically, like, yeah, let's get sledges going as fast as possible so we can just move stuff around. We'll come back to that, obviously. Essentially, leather wasn't that useful immediately. Probably should have got bone tools instead so we could make things out of bones instead of flint. And then I wouldn't be running out of flint as I claimed I was going to be. Well, we'll get everything, essentially. So it's not that much of a big deal to pick things in the wrong order, really. Just suboptimal. We can use the leather tech to make leather clothes, which your people prefer when it's hot. And sometimes it will be hot. So maybe that will make them happy and then more people come to your village. Something, something. It's all good. How are we actually getting this tech? Well, the way tech works is interesting and unique, but it's also like the big thing that I thought should be the most different about the game. So the way you buy tech is with knowledge points, and you get knowledge points for just doing stuff. So it's very general. You get some knowledge when you make an item, for example, and you get less and less knowledge the more you make of it. So, like, the first time you make a wooden spear, it gives you a knowledge point. Then if you make ten spears, you get another one. Then if you make a hundred spears, you get another one. So it's very, very diminishing returns to advance your tech tree by just constantly producing the same items over and over again. Encouraging you greatly to try new things and do new things, and every time you unlock some stuff, that gives you more potential for innovation. Like right there, we unlocked the leather tanning station, and we can get some more knowledge right away by building the leather tanning station. We'll get the plus one leather tanning station's built bonus, and then making leather using it will give us more knowledge, because that's another thing we're producing. So everything you do has the potential to build up your tech. I did enjoy that. The only thing I didn't like about it was there's a kind of arbitrary, like, god interventionness to it. Well, like, right there, when I was unlocking leather tech, it wasn't because we did something particularly that would lead us to think of a way to mash tree sap into skin to make better skin, which I think is what we're doing to make leather. As a random side point, I was thinking initially, isn't leather made by, like, peeing on skin in some way? I probably get all my Stone Age knowledge from watching, like, Bear Grylls or something, so, like, my solution to everything is just piss everywhere. Well, I don't know. Are people found 
a nicer way to make leather. They just sort of mash some tree sap into skin with a stone, and in some way, that makes better clothes. I don't know, the Stone Age people knew what they were doing, I presume. Anyway, the point was, it's not like we were mashing various different things into skins and eventually discovered leather. It's more like you just sort of told your people the answer to the leather question, using your knowledge points. But the knowledge points came very abstractly. It's like, well, I've caught ten fish. This gives me an idea. What if I pissed on this thing over here? Aha! A discovery, a breakthrough. And I feel like maybe the way tech worked could be more about experimenting. Like, if I was to design this game myself without having seen it, I might have imagined doing some system where you have some economic surplus, so you have people who don't need to be working all the time, and they would be able to kind of mess around with things. Or you could tell your people to like, well, go out on the hunt, but don't take it too seriously. Why don't you just watch the animals for a while and see what they do to get some more information on how to hunt that you can pass on. Like, even though it means you're probably going to come back with less food today, specifically, that sort of thing. So you try to get an economy that can sustain you messing about in such a way that you will eventually learn things. Well, that's a very abstract game design request, isn't it? Essentially, this is clearer when it comes to texts like domestication. Like, early on, you can unlock dog domestication, and it's just something that happens. Like, your people just have this idea that they could invite dogs to live with them. It's not like you kind of take the risk of trying to domesticate like a wolf, and they're really unhelpful, and then over time, if you really commit to putting resources into breeding new wolves, you'll get more and more useful animals out of that process, and eventually, you have achieved dog domestication in a sort of natural sense. Like, it's not like an on-off state. Are the dogs feral or are they domestic? They gradually became more useful to you, and at some point you decided to call them domestic dogs. Something more real like that. What I'm proposing is something much more annoying to develop, much more annoying to play, and completely at odds with how Dawn of Man worked. I thought I'd just throw that out. So, like, as we go through the tech tree, you just have these random jumps where nothing really happening in-universe seems to cause the jumps. You just get tech because God already knows everything. And if you impress God by mining ten stones, he'll tell you that, okay, guys, you know, if you give, like, the young dogs meat, they'll probably just live with you instead of their pack, and maybe they'll bark at enemies or something. That could be useful. Breed them to do that more. There you go. Even I, like, in the future, know everything already, apparently, so I think I could start my own Stone Age village because, you know, I've watched the anime Doctor Stone. That's all you need, really. What I'm saying is, I'm a genius compared to people in the Stone Age. So can I get a round of applause here? Like, <laughs> I had the piss idea. Like, they wouldn't have thought of that for ages, probably. I was in education until I was 22 years old. I've got a master's degree for some reason. And... These people, they'd probably be dead by 22. So, <laughs> I should be their god. And at last, we have Dawn of Man. Finally, I'm in my rightful place, ruling over these seven people in their glorious tents. And if they really impress me, I'll tell them about, like, stacking stones on top of each other to make stone structures or something. Like, I've, I've got all the ideas, guys. Like, if you slap stones together enough, sometimes they get really sharp and you can kind of do stuff with that. You know, you guys work that out. Right, now back to sitting back and watching my people do my bidding sometimes because they're automated. Like, in this game, we've accidentally given our people free will. It's a real god simulator. Like, I kind of want you guys to go and hunt animals, but because it's up to them when they're going to do it, in all sorts of scenarios, you might be frustrated if you're watching really closely and noticing your people aren't being very economically efficient. I think you can overcome that by micromanaging some more, but I didn't do it very much, and we'll, we'll come back to real examples of that. The final point to mention in this rant, which I just saw on the top right, is that it has a really customizable UI, this game. You can change what elements are permanently displayed on the UI, and I thought that was really good, and as we go through the campaign, you'll see me adding more and more things as I realised they were useful to have all the time. So while in a lot of games, I sometimes complain, especially in city builders, that it's not showing you information you need all the time, all the time, and you have to go in a menu to look something up. While Door of Man was like that at first, it has loads of really useful menus with info that you kind of constantly need to use and refer to. A decent amount of it can be brought forward onto the UI if you want, to always look at. And that's great. A rare and really useful feature of city building game design. I like it. 
You might have spotted earlier I was doing some dealings with a trader, and this is the way in which your town is vaguely, in an abstract sense, connected to other theoretical towns. Well, there's one other way actually, which we'll get to later. But for now, there are people who will come by and will offer to trade things with you, and this is a way to get various resources you need, maybe, but not really, because it's so unreliable. Like, it's not like there is a meat trader that is coming on any sort of schedule. It's just people will show up sometimes and they're carrying a few things and you might be able to trade something for them. Maybe that will save you in some niche scenario, but that's pure luck, so there's not much use relying on anything like this. They do sometimes bring you tech as well, and that's something I found quite interesting. It's something I thought the game might do a bit more of, this idea of tech spreading between communities. Like here, we can buy knowledge of slings off this person. They know how to make them, but... It's too quote-unquote expensive. There is no currency, but there is a de facto currency in that everything has a numerical value. So if I could give them enough stones, they would tell me how to make slings, something like that. Well, we'll come back to things like that because it's going to be an interesting way to advance in the game because one of the big finite resources is actually knowledge points and the ability to gain technology. So buying tech off of these theoretical other villages really is something to focus on, I think. Now, what's happening right here... Not too much, and the reason is in the top right, you can see it says 247%. That means there's way more work to do in the village than you have people to do it. Not necessarily a massive problem, because as long as there's stuff to do, people will do it, and, well, they're being productive, so it's, if it's over 100%, they're being as productive as possible. It's just that... Because they're choosing in what order to do the various tasks available, if there are loads, some of them just won't get done for ages, for years maybe. And some tasks are time-sensitive, like hunting. You want to hunt an animal while it's near the village, ideally, and they might walk off, but the task will still be there and your people will end up accidentally following them to the ends of the earth. Or you might want to harvest some fruits from a tree before they go bad, things like that. So not having any av available spare labour to do tasks as they come up can be a problem. To get around that problem, I mainly told my people to stop hunting because I was just mass hunting loads of things, more than I needed really early on. Here we see somebody worshipping this skull pole. That's because they needed to regenerate their morale, one of the many stats your people have. The game simulates all kinds of stats for your people, and to some extent you're trying to manage them, but they're also quite automated. So things like hunger and thirst, your people will just deal with that as long as there is some way of doing it. And the problem that arises from this system is just that sometimes they don't, similar to the workload thing. The automation, whereby your people will manage their own lives, isn't quite good enough that you can kind of trust them to get on with their lives in a productive way. You do need to keep an eye on people, and you'll see what I mean later on. Here was another of these Off-ED amazing moments where... I think it was only just over an hour into my gameplay when I decided to click on some of the buttons on the screen, opening loads of really useful menus like this one, which is where you set how much stuff your people are producing. A really essential menu that the game referred to a couple of times, but interestingly doesn't show you in the tutorial, and I discovered that by accident, so it's lucky I discovered it early, but it's definitely worth a mention. So here's where you decide like how many spears should our village produce, and here in the crafter we can see the automatic production thing going on where certain items are set to just be produced infinitely and it will make spears for example until everybody has one unless you go in that menu and tell it to not do that and you might want to micromanage things because you probably don't need like everybody to have an axe and a spear or something like that. Now here we can see my people being miserable close up. We've got the elderly carrying rocks up hills. Why? It's to make a burial mound so we can have somewhere to put the dead, which stops people getting so miserable when people die. But the reason they're miserable now is that we're making them do hard labour. Your people don't like doing things that are very difficult, like hauling trees and rocks. And they don't like doing things that are boring, like farming, which will come up later, of course. Like, ploughing the, the ground by hand is really boring and difficult. It's the worst of both worlds. People don't like that stuff. What they want to do is chase after deers and things. That's what we're evolved to do, I guess. And here was a perfect opportunity that I could not resist. Tons of goat and deer-like things. Mouflons, reindeers and ibexes. Early animals that we could easily hunt down are just right across the river from our village. Let's send somebody out, somebody nice and old, to go and deal with it and see how that goes. We're still collecting and curing meat, ready for the winter. 
What I wasn't sure of was how much I needed, and if I'd looked further into the UI, there is a way to find out how much food you're going to need. We'll see that later on. Things don't go very well back at the village though, because the animals roaming about the map can just come into your village if they happen to notice you're here, and a lion kills one of our children, so that's rather inconvenient, although we do also kill the lion so we can eat the lion, and, well, losing a child isn't as bad as losing an adult. We need to think about some real, like, in the wild economic logistics here. Children aren't very useful to the village. Adults do more stuff. And while you might say, well, you can get more adults if you have children, right? Isn't that where adults come from? No, it's not. Because in this game, it's much easier to get people through immigration than through reproducing in your tiny population. So just having the village be big enough that people could move into it will gain you way more people than trying to like just play the long game and raise children in the village. Hopefully my people will be inspired by this speech I'm giving to them in the village about why it's good that their children are dead. Again, I'm being a pretty good god to these people. Well, I guess I was good enough because once winter comes, things were fine. We had way more cured meat than we needed, as it turns out, with one less mouth to feed as well. And we also had that burial mound ready, so everything's going well to some extent. And we blast through the winter, earning some more knowledge points along the way. Surviving one of the winters was one of the big milestones, so like one of the objectives of the game. So we've done it. We haven't died in the first year. Things are looking up for our village. The question for me as a player is how sustainable is this? Like, we survived because we just killed everything near the village. Will more stuff show up? Will it keep showing up? How is the animal kingdom respawning? That's what we need to know about, really. We'll have to find out, because more time's passing, maybe we'll die. We've got enough knowledge, though, to unlock pottery. It's pottery time, boys. I'm going to skip over domesticating dogs and unlocking slings to get those pots as soon as possible. I was ready for this. This brings us into the Mesolithic era, as opposed to the Paleolithic era, I think that just means old stone and middle stone, so we're still thoroughly in the Stone Age. But now, we've worked out that if you kind of shape mud in a certain way and maybe cook it, you can make these permanent objects in which you could put other objects. And what this actually does in the game is let you store water in your village. What I was a bit confused by is that you unlock pottery, but what you don't do is make the pottery. Pottery is sort of unlocked in the abstract. So what it actually does is it lets you tell people to go to the river and collect water and water becomes a resource in your tents and in your storage facilities. That means that if people are doing something in the village, like not near the river, even though the village is right by the river, if they're slightly closer to a pot of water, they'll go and drink that when they're thirsty instead of river water, thus saving a bit of time. So you can imagine that the efficiency of your village is completely tied to the amount of time people spend walking around versus actually doing something. So if you can have all the food and water be together right next to like workstations or places people just happen to be a lot of the time, that will improve efficiency in some way, in a way that you can't look at. And this is one of these things where I was very conscious of the fact that our village probably is encountering economic problems constantly that are based on the layout of the, the buildings or like us not being close enough to the water or not being close enough to the trees and just having a layout that will in some way cause people to waste time all the time. And if you've watched some of my commentaries before, this is the sort of thing that I complain about quite a lot where there's some like defining feature of your economy that you can't look up, you can't get in number form, and so you can't analyse and improve it very much. You're just sort of guessing and playing it by ear and sort of hoping that being near the water is probably a good thing, that sort of stuff. Well, I think this is a game where because you don't really know where your people live, you don't know where they're going to get the next meal from, you don't know what task they're going to do next, there's really no way to micromanage the setup to get a really efficient thing going. And it goes into the Zen mode I sometimes refer to, where because actually making your economy good would be such a complicated task, just don't even do it. And of course, the game is probably designed with that in mind. You're probably not supposed to really micromanage things. So it will probably work out if you just put your tents in a circle like I did. Is that a good idea? Who knows? And that's the big point. One other rant point to actually hit on before we move on once again is going back to that pottery thing. So we unlocked pottery, we don't have to make it, and that was something that surprised me. And while I don't really mind at all, it's something that bothered me a little bit throughout the Dawn of Man experience, so 
there's no like moment to show for this, but broadly speaking, there are various impressions I had about what is important to a Stone Age village that Dawn of Man doesn't focus on, and pottery could be one example of them. I think I have this impression because if you look at descriptions of Stone Age cultures as far as we know about them, which is not very much, it pretty much talks about pottery. Like, these towns are defined by their ability to make and artistically craft pottery, and you can imagine how useful such things would be. It's the transition from being an animal with no inventory to being able to carry things and store things. That's pretty useful. There are billions of advantages you gain from that. So you can imagine pottery being a big deal, and I kind of thought you would have to make it or something. Like, it's not a task in the game to produce pottery or to sell it or do anything like that, when I feel like in real life, trading of pottery and ability to make it was like a sign of cultural dominance. Like, the successful villages were the ones that could make pottery, and they became, like, territories. They became cultures that had more than just a village because they were so influential because they had pottery. So it feels like this should be something the game would focus more on, and that's a general category of comments that came up throughout the game again and again, like something would shoot by, like, you domesticated dogs, like, isn't that a massive deal, the ability to domesticate dogs, like, isn't that something that's difficult to do, but doing it is such a triumph that it should be, like, more of a big deal. Same with domestication of, well, everything. We'll see as we go through, you can domesticate various animals and plants, and it's just really not something the game focuses on, and it feels like that's, like, the most important thing that the game should be focusing on, because that's what defined the progress of civilization, ability to gain the labor and produce of other living beings and combine it into our own economy. Well, it just kind of happens because you got five bones or something, or did something to gain knowledge points. And I just feel like this is so abstract. It's kind of missing the point of like what a Stone Age economy simulator quote unquote should be about in my own opinion. But there's one other thing that never happens in the game and I have no footage for that I wanted to rant about, which is your people all exist really independently in this game. Because the game is much more about the economy, that kind of makes sense. But just one thing to note from a sort of Stone Age immersion point of view is that your people don't socialize. And that's also like the big deal about like what we are as a species. Hey guys, remember what we are? We're like animals, or we used to be, but we kind of stopped being like them because of this really important thing where we could like recognize each other's faces and start like inferring information from that. And then we eventually started saying things as well. And we developed this thing called society. I know we all hate it now, but society is pretty useful in the wild. It's way better than not having any society. But in Dawn of Man, your people exist independently. They never interact with another person in the village. So like if you had one person, they would be acting exactly the same. And this struck me as something that like is another big important thing about the past that isn't represented in game. Like for example, you kind of expect your people's morale bar to not be based entirely on their ability to worship skulls, but to be like, do they sing? Like, can they dance? Things like that. This is what we like did in the past when there was nothing to do. It was just singing. Remember? Like, have you never noticed how everybody likes the sound of like choral voices reverbing in a sheltered space? You can imagine that in the far distant past, communities that were like that had a gigantic survival advantage. And maybe there's a reason we like that sort of thing automatically. Maybe people were doing that all the time. And I felt like that was something missing. Like there could be a whole strand of the tech tree, like the evolution of culture, like ability to remember songs and things like that, that binds you together. And this would give you morale and hunting bonuses and make your knowledge come in faster, things like that. The fact that we're working together is the thing that makes us powerful as like animals. Have you ever heard of the power of teamwork? <laughs> they were right, those Saturday morning cartoons. It really is useful to not be on your own the whole time, especially when you're in the middle of a river fighting a cave lion, which appears to be the situation one of our people is in. I can order somebody to come and help, but actually this old woman absolutely annihilated that cave lion, so things are going surprisingly well for them. But if there had been somebody else there, it might have gone a little bit better. And that was just something, like, overall I thought was missing from the game. Some kind of social aspect. And they couldn't really fit this into the economy the way it works, because your economy is so based on what your people are doing, like, microsecond to microsecond, 
If you had them stop to talk to each other, it would ruin everything. And you can imagine the player looking down, being like, I really wanted you guys to go and harvest some cherries across the river. But they're like, they've all decided to go off together to go and stand in a nearby cave and sing because it sounds nice when it echoes off the cave walls. And they just like doing that for some reason. It might be that the strain of their species that didn't like doing that died off for some reason. Well, who knows? And here I am today, annoyed at this from both perspectives. This is another you can't win game design moment. I would be angry if you had included that social stuff, because I would be that person being like, oh, it's ruining my ability to micromanage the economy, which is already ruined, so it doesn't really matter. But I'm also complaining that it's not there, because it's like, this isn't what a, like, a Stone Age village would be like. They wouldn't just silently walk around, killing everything and eating it and ignoring everybody around them. I don't know, well here I am, ignoring everybody around me, in a room that certainly doesn't echo because I've got these sound pad things on the walls to make my voice sound a bit less reverby. We've moved so far away from the Stone Age, we're so far away from what we're supposed to be doing as a species. This is what I was ranting about in my chess video recently as well. What our species should be doing is what the people in Dawn of Man should be doing. And that is neither playing chess nor playing Dawn of Man. But, well, here we are. This is what we've got now. This is where all of this society nonsense led us to. Complaining that the people in Dawn of Man are too antisocial. And I would also be mad if they weren't. Right? I think that's the rant out of the way. There's some kind of point here. Dawn of Man 2 needs an entirely different strand of gameplay based around the culture of your people developing and perhaps even influencing other towns. And maybe you'd actually get something from it like they would come to you for your pottery because yours is better. They would come to you for your religious ceremony because your singing's better. Something like that. Moving on. Down in the village, we're being attacked by lions once again. This happened quite a lot, but usually, if a lion attacks a villager, the villager will win the fight. Which, I don't know, is that realistic? Can a cave lion beat a human? I'm watching you, Dawn of Man. I don't know how accurate this really is. Well. There are various animals roaming around, only the lions really gave us any trouble. Really, we're the trouble, you can see me there setting up a hunting zone out there. I'm still not actually quite sure how the hunting zone works, but I think it's like a zone where any animal that walks through it will be marked for death, and eventually, even if it walks out of the zone, somebody will go and kill it later. We're also picking up sticks, we're picking up stones, you can see I've cut down a fair few trees near the village, making this space here. What I didn't know at first was, like, do you have infinite trees? Do they grow back? And the answer is yes, they do. It takes like five years to fully grow a tree, so they're pretty fast growing trees, that's handy. So if you're really careful, you can plan the deforestation such that you're always growing back certain areas while taking others, and you can sort of make that sustainable. You have infinite sticks, at least, that's something, although you can't use sticks for a lot of the stuff that logs, like proper wood, is used for. And you also have infinite fish. So while you can kill off the animals around your village, the river generates fish. It works in a slightly strange way. You might have seen there, like certain areas of the river can be depleted of fish, but if you tell your fishermen to walk down the river, the fish will be there again. Is that how it works? Do fish really hang out in like really one specific spot of the river? Probably not. Well, it's handy. Obviously, like, I am actually from the past. I know how everything happened in the past, but I forgot after traveling through time how the fishing works, so I can't really criticize this for its lack of realism. What is going on here? We've got a bit of economic control. I've told the crafter to be prioritized so that somebody will go and make some godforsaken clothes. We don't have enough clothes for everyone in the village at the moment. You need more clothes as people come in, because when people join the village, they join without clothes, annoyingly. And the clothes you have have degenerating health. They eventually fall off your body and you have to get some more. So I'm sitting there hoping somebody will make clothes. What I think I could do is select a villager and right click on the crafter to force them to start making the clothes right now. However, if you don't let the villagers do things according to their automated whims, they get all, all sorts of debuffs because they get hungry and thirsty and stuff, and because they're trying to follow an order, they'll do that instead of eating food. And when they're hungry, thirsty, tired, sad, or something, I think it hugely slows down the rate at which they do everything. Therefore, it might be better 
to just hope that somebody who's in a good mood will go and make the clothes rather than ordering somebody to do it and possibly ruining their mood and making the clothes really slowly as a result. I don't know how that works out, it's probably not like that, you probably should micro the villagers, but generally I wasn't. I was a bit perplexed here by, well, something that happened a few times during the campaign. When you unlock new tools, they aren't necessarily better than your previous tools, and it seems to be a result of the fact that things like your knives have an effectiveness rating out of, like, two or three. So because there are seven knives you can make in the game, a lot of them have to have the same stats, because there just aren't that many different numbers that the stats can be. So here, while I can now make flint knives, it's not better than bone knives, and I'm going to be basically wasting flint resources by making the quote-unquote better one, even though it actually said it wasn't any better. At first I just presumed it was better to get the newer ones, like maybe they last longer or something, or there's something better about it that it doesn't tell you about. So I did try to make the new tools as they came through, but then later in the campaign, after looking closer, I was like, well, not all of the new tech is actually better than the old tech. Stone Age forever, so we'll come back to that. Here's me starting to try to look up this workload thing and essentially determine, do I have more control over the economy? Because I want to know why the workload's so high and work out what's not being done, information like that. You can pull up this window where it tells you what people are doing now and what they're not doing, but should be doing. So if you monitored this for a while, you might be able to get an idea of the sorts of things that are being skipped over because the workload is too high. I'm imagining that there could be like a map mode filter, similar to the primal view where you can go and look at all of the things you can harvest in the environment, a version that highlights things that aren't being done or like work that has been left unattended for a while, and you could use that information to decide whether to manually intervene and force somebody to do something. I don't know. The workload thing was a little bit abstract because you just don't quite always know what isn't being done and how much of a problem is it that there's too much work? Like, are they leaving out the things that don't matter very much? Or is it something really important somewhere that's not being done and you just can't quite tell? What's happening here? We are going to find out about sledge making because somebody has brought a sledge to the village. I can trade away... Well, loads of stuff, because I didn't have anything valuable, so I gave them, like, loads of resources and loads of my tools as well. They can pull them off on their sled. In exchange, well, we sold the sled. We've, we've got that idea now. Maybe we can do that. We probably don't have the resources to make it. I think I traded away all of my leather, and you need leather to make sleds. So we actually can't use them at the moment. At some point, that will be useful, because my people will be really angry at having to move trees around and carry rocks. But with sleds, it's a bit easier, so that's the idea. And what I wasn't sure about at first was whether it's a good idea to spend so many resources to get tech, because you can get tech via the knowledge system. But in retrospect, getting knowledge is ultimately harder than getting stuff. So I think buying tech whenever you can is a good idea, and it's worth making sacrifices, even sacrificing people to get tech. Like, if you have to give away all of your food to get tech, that might be worth it. Because you can get more people, they spawn, whereas knowledge is finite in the game. The good news is that one of my people didn't die there. There is a system where if they're about to lose a fight, they'll try to run away. And in that case, the lion they were fighting didn't chase them, so that's handy. Why are they fighting a lion over on the other side of the river? Probably because of my hunting area, which I was then playing with. Something must have walked through the lion's territory and our person followed them and got attacked by the lions. So they're not quite intelligent enough to pull off hunts without you paying loads of attention. One thing you can do is manually select a little group of people and send them to hunt a specific animal, which will be more efficient. You just have to pay attention. And there's the other issue that I mentioned earlier, where if you tell people to do something manually, they'll forget some of their needs and it might cause issues. And they can even die from doing that. So like if you tell them to do something when they're like starving to death, they will do it instead of getting food, no matter how easy it would be for them to get food. Well, I'm just adjusting all of my economy here, which is basically the entire game. Like, I've got tons of footage of me just poking about, trying to get the workload down, really. Trying to work out, like, why do our people think they have so much to do? Is it because lots of them are thinking about doing things I don't really care about, like taking wild rye from across the river or something like that? We don't really need them to do that, so maybe I shouldn't. Those are the sorts of considerations to make. But then I also think, 
If the workload was to dip below 100%, I would like there to be spare tasks for people to go and get on with so that we're still making some use of the extra productivity. So I don't know, I feel like there might also be a tiredness penalty. So if you run your village at more than 100% for a long time, your people get tired and that also slows you down. Not quite sure how that works because I wasn't paying enough attention. I was just being really like a taskmaster. I was like, you always have to have over 100% workload, so there's always something to do. But I feel like later in the game, when I chilled out and let people just hang out at 30% workload, they kind of looked like they were getting more done. I don't know. This is the whole four day work week thing, but for the Stone Age, it's back at it again. People really do get worse and worse the more you work them. And it might actually be worse to give people a lot of work. You get less work done as a result. We are learning modern management techniques here as a god in the Stone Age. One thing that was really holding me back actually in the early economy was flint. You saw me earlier setting up production for loads of new flint tools like scythes and picks, which aren't necessarily better than what we had before. But the point is, Flint is kind of hard to come by, and of all the resources I found myself lacking throughout the entire playthrough, Flint was always at the top of the list as being something there didn't seem to be enough of to do everything that used it. Flint in the game isn't really like Flint in real life as well. Here we can rant again. It's the man time traveling from the past. I used to be a Flint miner in 1.5 million BCE. And I can tell you with some confidence that Flint mining in this game is too different, I guess. Like, Flint either just exists as piles on the ground, which you can go and pick up at the beginning, and then later you can mine Flint out of the side of the mountainous areas. And, well, isn't Flint, I don't actually know that much about Flint, guys, but isn't it like in sand or something? Yeah, I think Minecraft gets it more right. In Minecraft, guys, if you mine gravel, sometimes there's Flint in amongst it. I feel like it forms underwater or like in like sediments of riverbanks or something write in the comments what is flint i'm basically confident enough to say that dawn of man doesn't get it right and again because flint is like a core of the stone age economy like pottery it's like here's something that should be right in fact here's some footage of an old woman mining flint in a huge like blob off the side of that mountain i don't know Maybe flint should be found in the river banks rather than on the mountainsides. Seems like that wouldn't be a big balancing change or a gameplay change, but maybe that's where flint actually comes from. I am going to claim that the man who's done no research knows more than people who probably went on the Wikipedia when making this game about the Stone Age and looked up a couple of Stone Age things to include in the game. However, I'm a time traveller, something, 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 singing, flint mining, that's more like Minecraft. Guys, why aren't we playing Minecraft? Minecraft is much more realistic than Dawn of Man in many ways. I just got back from the past again, and I think I was right. And by the past, I mean Wikipedia. There's something going on with Flint. But let's not worry about Flint, even though the game is actually complaining right now that I don't have any Flint, because we have made some progress somewhere amid the ranting. We're actually almost halfway through the milestones. And our village doesn't really look any different to how it was when we started. We're still just hanging out in tents. We've just got like four times as many people and as many tents. Well, to get further in the game, we're going to have to make some larger steps. So the milestones will come on slower. Here we've made the first step towards some kind of agriculture. We've got a flour processing stone, a mortar, which right now we can only use to process seeds which we collect from the wild. And there won't be many of those. And this is where my desire for some sort of domestication gameplay comes in once again. I want to be planting the seeds from the biggest plants beside the village over and over again every year. Until eventually you have some sort of reliable thing going on where there always seems to be seeds growing beside the village. And boom, that's domesticated plants. But in the game, you just unlock domestication of plants and you skip to the end when you have the new species you've created through that process that I'm wishing was more of a game mechanic. And you'd integrate it in such a way that if you were running out of food, you'd have to eat the seeds you're saving up for your domestication program, which would reset the program. So there's some sort of risky, rewardy thing going on there, some sort of game thing going on there. Instead, it's just nothing. It's all abstracted away. Now, this footage of a dog fighting a bear is actually related to what I was talking about, surprisingly enough, in that the dog is another domesticated thing. We have domesticated dogs and now we've lost a domesticated dog. 
The way dogs work are different to other animals, in that once you've invented quote-unquote domesticated dogs, you just seem to have them. You don't actually do anything to get them, they just show up. I'm not sure where we're planting the dogs and what trees they're growing on. You just get dogs, and I think you have an infinite supply of dogs. They just sort of show up and come back when they die, so that's handy, I guess. Here you can see I actually bothered to do some micro to finish off this bear since that dog had nearly killed it. So what do the dogs do? Well, they hunt animals for one, and that might be a bad thing if they're going after bears and getting themselves killed. They go with your people when you tell them to go out of the village and hunt things, and I suppose they add some DPS to the hunt. The other thing they do, which I don't know if this actually does anything, but this is more like realistic. This is more like, yes, this is how I imagined a dog in a Stone Age village to be earning its keep. It sits around. How is that earning its keep? Well, the dog is on watch. The dog is smelling for threats and things and noticing things happening that the villagers can't. And in particular, the pack of wolves that you've trained to live in your village will keep away the other packs of wolves that are wild allowing you to not have to worry about being attacked by wolves so much. Things like that. Now this doesn't actually happen in the game, so the dogs being on guard doesn't do anything. However, I believe they don't use any food either. So dogs are just a freebie, you don't have to do anything to get them. Once they're here, they don't consume any resources, and sometimes they will attack animals for you, for you and do some free damage. So it's all good to have dogs, and it unlocks other domestication projects as well. It just seems like, again, something was missed there. Maybe there was some gameplay stuff you could do about getting particular dogs and breeding kinds of dogs in your village that will have like unique stats based on what you chose to breed them for. Something like that. Essentially, I want a generalized domestication mechanic, so the same thing for dogs would go for plants as well, where your version of a plant, the named species you're making, has certain stats and you're influencing that in some way, trying to make something useful for whatever you need that thing to do for your economy. Here, we're trading away our economy to work out spirituality as a tech. Not sure why we have to unlock that. Basically, we're unlocking the totem pole. That's the thing you get for the spirituality tech. And you saw me trading away there absolutely tons of tannin. Tannin kind of became my money at one point because I realized it's really easy to get tannin because every spring all of the trees around the village will produce it and you can just quickly pick it up and have loads. And because it's worth one value unit, like same as many harder things to get like big stones, you can just trade it for stuff with the trader. So that's my early game tip. Use tree sap as a currency and the people from the other villages can be fooled into accepting it. There's the totem pole going down, I'm going to put it outside our tents so our people will get miserable, go outside and worship the totem pole to get happy again. You could make a religion out of that, but we didn't. And I suppose that's the point to make. We have this spirituality breakthrough, but we don't actually get any spirituality, it's just a way to get happy. That's slightly different to worshipping human skulls in the ancestor worship thing we had before. Now we also have nature worship but it's just the same, and it doesn't really do anything. I don't know, it feels like I want more of a handle on what this is. It's not really what the game's focusing on, and I'd just like somehow for it to also focus on that. Looks like another cave lion came in and died so fast that, that I couldn't even see it alive after instantly clicking on the notification. Our people are extremely powerful. They're just like one-punching cave lions that come into the village. No mercy. And the way that they're all so like silent, they never say anything, they never display any signs of tiredness. We're just like a Terminator village right here, mercilessly exerting our will on the natural world. Occasionally that world tries to get back at us, like right here, this bear is going to attack us apparently. What am I going to do? Well, you can see I'm sizing up my villagers, being like, who am I going to send over there to deal with the bear? I was originally thinking maybe I'll select people with like the best weapons or something, because they all have different inventories. I eventually thought, we can bum rush them, let's just send them all in. I hesitated for like one microsecond because I realized I was sending in a few children as well. Then I thought, nah, send the kids in first, if anything. Well, it turns out you're not allowed to send them in because there are all kinds of tasks that children aren't allowed to do and fighting animals is one of them. So a while back when I was saying that we should sacrifice our children because they don't contribute to the economy, they actually do, they just only do certain things, like they carry things around or do tasks very close to the village, I think. I never actually saw a list of what they're allowed to do. They will sometimes do some work if there is some. After that bear victory, I decided to up the ratio of bows in the village so that 75% of adults have a bow, or at least there are enough bows that they could do that, they're all deciding their own inventories, because it's a better way of fighting animals than throwing spears, essentially. 
and we've just about got the economy to do it. You have to kill animals to get the components to make bows, so you need a sort of good cycle going there, and we're doing well enough. Early on and throughout this period of the game, I was never really experiencing any shortages of anything that wasn't flint, and right now I've actually got loads of flint. Things were just generally okay for the economy. I never came close to having a food shortage or like having anyone be hungry. Which you might think is a nice thing for our village, but well it's not actually guys, because as an omniscient god I know that we shouldn't be quote unquote floating resources, and one of the resources we have is the length of the hunger tolerance of the people. To put it another way, our economy would be working faster if everybody was just about alive. Although there are the debuffs from being hungry, I don't know what they are, it's something along the lines of you work slower. However, I think there's still something to be said here from a strategic point of view for not having as much food as I do now, like we have a lot more food than we need. That means economy time is being spent making food which is just going to de degrade and well our people are too full, they're wasting time eating food, stuff like that. You could envisage a slightly better economy where a certain amount of the population dies every year and gets replaced and in some way you're getting a big economic boost from the fact you're not working on food so much, you're doing things like just making loads of houses to attract more immigrants or mining loads of stone or something and stockpiling it for later on so that once you have the need for stone and you can make stone buildings, you can really rapidly upgrade the village. Some kind of long-term plan like that would be viable. Obviously, as the deity of this village, I'm trying to get down on paper all the possible reasons why I would, like, allow my people to die off. Like, we're doing the whole problem of evil or problem of suffering, I forget what it's called. The thing in philosophy where people complain that various gods are supposedly working for us, but they let terrible things happen all the time. So now I'm in that position. If I'm going to let my people die off, I want to have a great on paper plan, a presentation ready to give on why those people dying off was good for the economy or something like that. We've got to think about these sorts of things. Why are we thinking about these sorts of things? Well, it's because you don't do that much else in this game. And this is a point I wanted to quickly make because, well, we're not really getting this across in the video, I think. Because most of the time in Dawn of Man, nothing is happening, and because I'm going to be skipping over a lot of stuff in this video, you miss the fact that this game's really chill, it's very relaxed. The vast majority of the time, either nothing's happening or you don't have to be doing anything, which is actually evidenced in this footage. Looks like I'm not even moving the mouse. Oh, there we go, I moved the mouse. I'm probably looking at the screen, and that's about the level of gameplay interaction we're at right now. You're usually just waiting for something to happen. You're waiting for some knowledge to come in from you producing something, waiting for some people to come back from the hunt with some more resources, just watching the resource numbers go up, things like that. Which leads to a very chill experience, especially if you don't play it with the game speed turned up. You can turn up the speed using the thing I added to the UI in the top right there. If you played it on the default game speed, I'm pretty sure like it would be 20 minutes between you having to make any inputs to the game. It, it would really just be a village simulator that you're watching and a very pleasant and quaint gameplay experience, I think. And I enjoyed this. I always enjoy, well, I, there's, there's two kinds of games I enjoy. One where it's non-stop interaction, like furious gameplay, and one where there's barely any gameplay at all. Those are my two <laughs> strands of things that I like. And this was really hitting the barely any gameplay at all kind of game. A game where it's mainly about managing resources that will just come in. Like, you don't actually do anything to get the resources. You're just telling some system to get them for you. And you're just directing things at the strategic level. And this doesn't really involve doing very much. Managing things is easy, guys, especially when you're an all-powerful god who can justify their mistakes with all kinds of high-level philosophies. Something, something. Your kid's dead. Your dog's dead. But look at how much tannin we have to trade for things when the people come round with two loaves of bread. It was all worth it. Things are actually going great in this village. However, it isn't going to be like that forever, as we'll see. We have made some great progress. It's agriculture time. When did that happen? I don't know. So that's just one of the things to point out. Yes, we've domesticated crops now. This was about five minutes in game after the last clip and nothing happened in between. 
We're now gonna plant some stuff. We've got three new species of plant that we can grow on the other side of the river in this little space I'd made earlier. So let's do it. I'm doing it very inefficiently because you plant the different things in these columns. You can have up to five by five like grids of the crops and essentially I've left some gaps in between these crops. So we're gonna get less stuff per area from that setup, but I guess I'm just experimenting with this. We want to plant all three of the different things because there is plant disease in the game. Something that's strangely not very much simulated is like disease and illnesses, medical issues. But plants actually are vulnerable to diseases, so you need to have lots of them just in case one species dies off in a given year. So with that planned out, our people will start planting stuff. The good news is that you get an infinite supply of seeds for the various farmable crops. And this is where it's at odds with what I imagined this mechanic might be like, where if you have a food shortage, you might be forced to eat the seeds of your domesticated things to stay alive and you thus lose your domestication, making it more of a thing, more of a challenge to try and keep a domesticated species going. Something like that. It's nothing like that. We can just make crops appear now. Those crops are going to produce hay, so I'm slapping down haystacks so we can just store it somewhere. We don't have any use for hay at the moment, but that's where this thatching technology comes in. We can unlock the ability to build with thatch and mud. So we're going to get loads of thatch in a second once we start harvesting tons of crops and we get all of the runoff from that. As for the mud, well that's actually easy enough to come by as well. It has to be river mud specifically, so now my rants about flint are coming back around. Now I do have to harvest this stuff from the river. And I actually did find that I was running out of mud very frequently. We need like a, a mod where you can mine mud or farm mud by like having your people just pour water from the river into a hole somewhere and then taking the produce out of the hole to make wet dirt into mud. Something like that. There is premium mud over there at the river. Maybe it needs to be like clay or something. That's what it's getting at. We can use that to make walls. We can use the thatch to make roofs. In theory, we can start upgrading the village to look a bit more substantial. But that's going to be a while because we need to gradually gather the materials. The nice thing about mud is that it regenerates in the river. It works the same way as fish, basically, but it has the opposite problem. In that while fish don't specifically live in like one spot of the river, they do regenerate. Whereas mud doesn't regenerate, but yes, it is in specific spots of the river because you're digging it out permanently. I don't know, they use the same mechanics and they've got two sides of the same problematic coin going on. But essentially you can get infinite mud from next to the village, it just regenerates. It's also I think one of the tasks you can get the children to do, so now we have more economic purpose to keeping the children alive. That's going to make the people happy I guess, because I'm probably going to sacrifice their children a tiny bit less now. We need them to do manual labour. Here's a storm occurring. Storms happened quite frequently in the campaign. What I don't know, like looking back on it all, is what they do. It stops your time acceleration when a storm happens, implying you're supposed to quickly do something about it. Maybe it damages your buildings and you could do something to prevent that. Not quite sure. I just never reacted to there being like storms and I guess it was fine. <laughs> so that's the end of that. Someone in the comments, what's the storm thing about anyway? So now with our new thatch technology, we've got this little granary going on the edge of the village. We're going to use that to store some grains because it is now autumn and the stuff has grown over there. Going to put down a closer granary here. We do need to think about the logistics here because if your people harvest stuff and immediately take it to the granary, then that's less time spent harvesting stuff. So we want them to be walking around not very much during the autumn season when they can harvest this stuff. Well, that doesn't matter very much. Essentially, we're starting to get grains, but... Here's the thing, we can't eat the grains, we need to do something with it, and that's why I started poking around in the tech menu here. Because at the very end of the tech tree is bread making as a tech, as an Iron Age tech. So I'm suddenly like realising, like, wait a second, I've started this Stone Age agriculture, but we actually don't know what to do with tons of grass seeds, so like, what are we going to do with this? There's the oven that I don't have. One thing we can do is feed it to animals. You can unlock various animal domestication techs, in the Stone Age. So maybe it's for that, I thought, but actually no, you can feed it to the humans, and my journey to find out how to do that takes me through the Dawn of Man in-game wiki thing. This is a really good resource filled with explanations of how to do stuff in the game, and it's the kind of resource that I like to see in particular because it really gels with my house rules of 
no going to walkthroughs. Like, there are so many scenarios in games where I would, in my commentary, make a complaint. Like, the game doesn't tell you how to do this, or like, I didn't know how to do this, and so I never did it. And then someone in the comments would be like, you should have gone to the walkthrough. Like, it's your fault for not knowing this. And I always say, no, it's not. Like, I don't have to go to the walkthrough. That's like a principle that I put down. So in this game, there was stuff I didn't know, but there's a walkthrough in the game. And that's the way that I always advocate for it to be done in cases where like walkthrough tier knowledge is required to play the game at all. If there is detailed information that the game won't explicitly tell you, or you can't intuit through the game, then it just needs to have a walkthrough in the game as part of it. And having a codex system of some kind is the usual way to do that. And this game has a nice wiki-like thing. And it explains that you can also make bread using a hearth, which is what the game calls a fire, essentially, like a fireplace, our campfire in the middle of the village. That means a new age of misery is upon us because it's farming time. You can already see the notifications above people because they're starting to get sad. They don't like it. Essentially because every stage in the process of feeding the village using bread takes a long time and is really boring and is really difficult and people don't enjoy it. They want to go hunting or something. Nope, we're going to stay right here. We're going to grind flour from seeds by hand. That must be super boring. Then we're going to make what must be like the most disgusting bread of all time. I'm guessing we're just mixing flour and water, making a kind of gruel mixture and then just cooking it so it's like hot, solid, probably burnt gruel. And then we eat that. Pretty good stuff. Makes me think, can we offer some spreads or something? Like, there are things in the environment from which we could make preserves in order to make bread a more interesting food stuff, but I guess we can't. The upside to eating bread that the game was talking about in the wiki is that the grain lasts for a long time, so we can skip out the meat curing stage to some extent and have less food that's going off all the time. The thing about the meat curing stage is it just happens for free, you don't have to do anything to get it. And now our people have to annoyingly process flour every time they want to eat something because the flour goes off quite quickly as well. So you ideally want to be having a large stockpile of grain but a small stockpile of flour and then people have to go and cook the bread. They're going to be annoyed about that. You know what I'm annoyed about? Domestication issues. Once again, there's two more things that the agricultural revolution brings to mind that would help us make this a less miserable experience for us. The first thing is cats. Yes, we've got dogs, but where's the cats? I don't actually know the history of domestication of cats to any extent, only that I presume it came at the same time as the practice of keeping grain for a long time in granaries. The deal being that the cats hunt the various small animals that will eat grain. So just having cats around the farms and walking around the fields means you get more food. But there's no cat domestication. Could have thrown that in as a free text similar to the dog thing where cats will just randomly appear and you'll just see them walking around the village as a little detail. You can also see I've unlocked bridge building. Bridge building is surprisingly difficult in this game because you can only build bridges between like certain points on the riverbank. It seems a bit stingy about what you're allowed to do. So I'm going to gradually work out how to make a bridge. You might also have noted though that you don't really need a bridge because your people can just walk across the river and your people can swim freely as well. They don't get carried along by the current. So it's fine for me to build on the other side of the river, but it will be a bit faster, I guess, if I could get a bridge going, which I might do eventually. Now, the other domestication thing that's missing that, well, it comes to mind because of my rant about how disgusting the bread must be, it's bees. We could be producing honey as part of our agricultural projects, and that's just something that it feels like the game should have at some point. Like, you can make a beehive, and it generates some honey, and your people are a bit happier to be eating bread if there's also honey as well, so it doesn't just taste like starch. That sort of thing. I don't know when bee domestication became a thing, or whether it became a thing everywhere, because again, even though I'm from the past, I kind of forgot what happened in the past. Like, obviously I've been to all of these eras in real life, and I, f I forget, like, sometimes I remember seeing, like, they had these big, like, tubes. Like, if you hollow out the inside of a tree trunk and put it on its side, bees will probably live in it, and you can just keep loads of those right beside your village, and eventually you'll have a massive bee population at the village, which help helps you do your agriculture, and now and again you can go in, put your hand inside the tree trunk, and see what you can steal if you're having a good time. Yeah, that's probably how you farm, honey, <laughs> ancient style. There's probably a way for us to domesticate a small insect. I don't know, just feels like that was probably something that was a big deal in the past, because 
most stuff you can eat is kind of a miserable experience if you don't have honey. Honey's actually really nice. I realized this recently. I was eating some honey the other day, and I was like, it's nicer than, like, most stuff that exists. So, like, having honey be, like, a core part of your daily routine, your daily diet, would be a really good idea. It's the honey propagandist back at it again. This game needs way more bees. Well, the good news is, looks like our people are weaving something together here. We're going to have our first hut. We're moving up from the tent world to the hut world. Doing this upgrade gives you an extra space per building. And the building's floor area doesn't really change very much. So even though our tents are close together, it will be possible to upgrade them all into these huts. And that will increase our maximum population without having to spread out very much. And also, I believe the huts will last longer. They have a bigger health bar. We haven't really been talking about this, but... As I said, the buildings do degenerate, and it costs resources to just have the buildings exist, because your people constantly put new skins and new wood into the building to keep its health up. These better buildings will last longer, although, because we need thatch and mud to repair them, those things might be a little bit harder to come by, because those are also going to be the primary building materials for, like, everything that we need. So we need loads of these materials. So it might even be worth keeping your population living in tents, because you can constantly repair the tents using animal skins if you're still hunting at least a bit, or have a massive amount of domesticated animals so you can get skins whenever you want. And save all of your straw and mud for making new infrastructure and new important things like warehouses. Who knows, there might be some strategy here, again based around making our people's lives a bit more miserable. I think we can even bring in the bread misery thing here as well, because the huts come with their own fireplaces on the inside. So that means your people don't have to go to the communal one to cook bread, which might increase their logistical efficiency, like they might eat while they're also in there to sleep, or something like that. Which comes with the downside, that you have to deliver logs to the houses to fuel those fires, and that probably comes with a logistical overhead, and of course it demands more logs from the environment, and we've already cut down a whole bunch of the trees nearby. Who knows, I feel like there's some sort of trade-off to upgrading your housing, and it might really be worth it to keep your people in squalor so that they don't start their own fires and they don't mess things up. Like, we're giving people luxuries that's going to put a strain on the economy. Once again, we can't let the proles find out about luxury behaviours. We can't let them realise that they could all have their own personal fire, because then they'll all want one and we'll have to like get tons of fuel from the environment and there'll be pollution everywhere. It's all going to spiral out of control. Here's where it begins. It's starting to spiral out of control. And we're also, on the topic of spiralling out of control, going to start moving towards our village's sort of dark age to some extent that comes about with the advent of th these new technologies, not just because everybody's miserable all the time, although that probably does factor into it. It's because there aren't that many animals living near the village anymore. So because we still need animals for our economy, we have to go further and further away to get them. And with people being miserable, this also slows down the rate at which they do everything, which means going further away takes even longer. And that's going to start causing various issues, as we'll see in a second. First, we have a different category of problem we do need to think about. And that is that this game has combat. You can be invaded in your town, and to help out with that, I've now invented fortifications. So I'm starting to wall off a couple of the approaches to the village. Now this practically isn't really going to happen because there are so many approaches to the village and because a lot of these mountains we see around us, these very small mountains, are completely passable. So they can attack us basically from any direction. Who is they? Well, we'll see them in a second. My plan then was just to do this, put a watchtower in the middle of the town. This is like an archery tower where a couple of people with bows will go in and shoot at enemies. I kind of thought, Maybe if there's a battle over the village, we can make it take place on our bridge, and we'll have the watchtower here to do something. So that was about as far as I planned. I don't think I'm ever going to get to use this watchtower, as we'll see, because the combat went differently to what I was imagining at first. However, we do get knowledge for building it, so it's still worth just putting one somewhere. We're not getting nothing from this. Suspiciously soon after I unlocked fortifications, we actually do get attacked, and I wonder if you have to unlock fortifications to unlock the ability to be attacked, or maybe it was just good luck. Here they come. It's only three people, but they're gonna come and try to start killing us. The good news is that of all the directions they can approach from, they're attacking at the most choke pointy part of the village, where there are some impassable rocks blocking the approach from that direction. 
and you can see I've put a gateway over there to make a place we can defend. This gate doesn't work, but well, we'll see that in a second. Here are the little combat controls you have at the top right, which are really useful. You can press a button to close all your gates, and another button that alerts the village, which essentially deploys anyone who can fight to just fight right now, and they just start rushing towards the problem area. Some of them, as you can see, are rushing straight back. Maybe they don't want to fight. I think it's because it sends everybody over, but people who have some like dire needs, like they're really hungry or something, will immediately leave the combat as well. Not quite sure. Well, anyway, some of our people go out around the gate and start fighting, thus revealing that our gate system doesn't actually block the enemy. Luckily, they're still standing outside, so I open the gates to let everybody out, and we just completely spam them with javelins and bows. Thus, we win a glorious victory, and you get some knowledge as well for killing people like this, so that's handy. And it teaches us the real-life lesson that probably defending our village using walls isn't going to be very viable. But defending using a human wave is going to be viable. I think that rather than walling off the town, we should focus on just having everybody run out of the town when attackers come in and just swarm them. And, well, it probably doesn't matter if we take casualties. Like, if you think about the man-hours of labour lost to battle casualties versus how long it would take to actually wall off, like, every direction, all the resources it would require, it might be worth sacrificing people once again God is back at it with this high-level economic logic. Well, we're actually not really going to focus on that style of gameplay, because I did think at first, I'm going to try and wall off the town. It was because at first I didn't really realise how passable the mountains are. Like, it kind of looks like if I put a wall along this flat bit here, maybe this area would be considered defended. Well, it is and it isn't. It isn't because of this passability thing I'm talking about. The enemy can walk over most of the rocks around the village. Only certain ones, or parts where it's really steep, are not passable to people on foot. So, this wall here, the enemy can just walk around it, like, easily. They can just walk along the hills, or if they come at us from the direction that isn't this one, they will never encounter this wall, so it's a waste of time. A very inefficient use of resources, because we have to cut down so many trees and dedicate so much labour to making this wall. It's going to be a waste of time. Or is it? Because actually how combat works in the game means that building a random wall like that is surprisingly useful. And we'll see that later. What am I doing now? Well, here's where this downfall I've been referring to really began. It's partially my fault, partially the game's fault. I had the wrong idea about how to do something, basically. What am I doing? I'm looking around the environment for animals to domesticate because we've unlocked goat domestication. That means if we can find something that's kind of like a goat, we can order our people to domesticate it. So the way it works is your people go out and capture animals, and this just sort of turns them into domesticated animals. But that going out part is going to be the problem, because as I mentioned, there aren't that many animals near the village anymore, and I'm having to look further and further afield for young ibexes that we can convince to become goats in our village. I was overzealous about doing this because... Well, it's because of how far away from the village these ibexes are. Like, I wasn't really thinking about that because, well, let's be honest, I have no idea how far I am from the village here in this footage. The map is gigantic, and it's kind of hard to navigate, so obviously I had no idea where I was as a god floating around. I just sometimes saw goats, and I thought, well, there's one. Like, let's put that on the list as something to try and domesticate later and hope it gets done. The issue is, it's the start of winter right now, the worst time to be taking on tasks that take place outside of the village. Well, at least it is in retrospect. At the time, I didn't think this was a problem at all. Because I thought, our people have winter clothing, and that means their like, heat bar doesn't go down. We've already solved the winter problem, so it's fine to go out in winter and get animals. Well, maybe not. And part of the reason, actually, I needed to get the goats specifically now was that... We don't have enough fur in the village to make winter clothing for everybody. So I was kind of thinking it would be great if I could domesticate a couple of things like right now and maybe they'd reproduce and give us this like infinite fur economy because we could constantly kill the older ones once the new ones come in, something like that. Obviously that's not going to be really useful for this winter, but that's what I was thinking about. So we've got this grand plan. Somebody will go and bring us some goats. However, when your people leave the village, 
They don't do it in the most intelligent possible way, and we'll see the issue in a second. The other thing I wanted to mention is that here's a case where we start to feel the lack of the ability to prioritize tasks. And again, I'm talking about something that's not on the screen, and that's the problem. For example, right now, I would like the whole village to work on getting more furs, like just finding something to kill, so that we could get a bit more clothing going for this winter. But a lot of our village is probably thinking about cutting down trees to build that gigantic wall I told them to build on the other side of the river. And what I would like to be able to do is just say don't do that this season. Like I want to say this season the priority is warmth and food, like I don't care about building the gates in winter. Now you could sort of do this with micromanagement, like I could cancel all of the construction and then put it down again in spring. And I could select some villagers and tell them to go and hunt something big to get a load of furs, like look for a mammoth in the environment to get some fur now by micromanaging that. But I guess what I wanted really is the ability to more intelligently and more directly automate things, to be able to say things like don't make the wall during winter, just get food, like just get warmth, stay inside if you want, I don't care about making the wall right now. And what I don't know is to what extent is the fact I have the wall ordered, like ruining the economy, how much of our labour time is going away because people are just walking over there to go and look at the wall and like start finding a tree to cut down or something like that. Probably a decent amount of it, our workload isn't that high so we've got free people to do stuff but there's still like really specific things I want them to do right now above all other priorities. You do have a system in the game where you can sort of prioritize things a bit, like right now our crafting station is on high priority mode, hoping that that will cause people to make clothes first and foremost, but I don't know, we've got free labor and people aren't doing it right now, so I guess I just wanted to really prioritize things, like seriously guys, did you know you don't have winter clothing and it's winter right now? Please stay inside or like just make the clothing immediately. Like, can we talk to each other about this? I guess not. Looks like somebody is being mauled by a lion very far from the village. Unfortunately, she is not a one-punch man and is defeated. The lion is defeated as well and runs off, so neither side dies, but well, they're gonna have to try and find their way back to the village, I guess. That's something that actually came up a few times, this idea of making your way back to the village. I constantly got the camera like out here somewhere, and then I'm like, wait a minute, where's the village? And I'm kind of stuck. <laughs> That's probably what's happening right now in this village. I'm like, well, I've zoomed the camera off to some location. That's probably because someone walked off to look for a goat and has just gone off on an adventure somewhere. Now I'm stuck out here with them. I don't know the way back. We really, 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 really need a mini map or something like that. There probably is one for all I know. I was just really stuck and I kind of thought maybe there's something I can double click on to like jump the camera back to the village. Well, I don't think I found one and I'm sort of stuck waiting for like someone to die in the village or something so a notification comes up and I can jump over to look at that. Well, this happened more than once as I recall. It definitely happened multiple times where I was stuck marauding around all of these mountains just looking for evidence of like where our village even was. It doesn't have any smoke coming up from it or anything like that. So I needed to notice a landmark that I recognized, but as you might have seen, the entire world is full of nearly identical looking mountains and hills all over the place. It's also gigantic. So I didn't know where the village was. It's actually getting a little bit crazy. And somebody just died of hypothermia. That means they shouldn't have been walking about at, in winter, of course. And this is where the problems are going to really start this time, because once people die, your village automatically gets a task to find them and bury them. That means more people will go to where that person died. So if they died somewhere really weird, like wherever I am now, like presumably a thousand miles from the village, people are going to start going over there and they're not going to take any food. They're not going to take any water. They're probably not going to take winter clothing by the looks of things. This is where problems are really going to start stacking on top of each other because the automated system doesn't work. And finally, I managed to rant long enough to get to the part of the footage when I found the village again. We're finally home. I did it. We quote unquote survived the winter as it said, apart from that one lady, well let's just try not to worry about that. But our people are worried about that. And we'll see that our people having this distant concern that some of them will constantly try to walk off and do until they get hungry and come back halfway, or maybe they won't come back when they're hungry, well we'll see what I mean about that. 
Little did I know at the time, my handle on our economic situation is gone. What do we have though? We've got a goat or two. So some of our people actually did find some goats and somehow they're back here in domesticated form. There isn't really a domestication process of course as I keep ranting about. They just become a different species or a different breed. And now we have goats. So in theory, we can milk the goats. You don't, you don't have to develop lactose tolerance, by the way. We already have it, so that's handy. And we can kill the goats for meat and fur. And they're in the village, so it doesn't matter that there aren't too many animals living, like, right by the village at the moment. Well, we still need more furs, and, well, we need more goats as well. So I'm going to keep giving more and more orders for people to go out and find these things. Again, if you look at the numbers... We lost one villager and we got two goats. That's a pretty good trade. Like, a, a goat's worth at least half a villager, probably. <laughs> at least in my new voting system. So I was happy to keep going, despite having seen what the risks could be and seen that the AI can't necessarily survive on its own if you tell them to walk off from the village really far. Well, let's just let them do it again and maybe they'll get it right this time. Back in the village, somebody is going to tell us about building things out of big stones, and they can even provide us with a few desperately needed furs. How do we pay for this? We're going to give them loads of grass and loads of tree sap. And because there's this like minimum value where things that are kind of worthless are still worth one point in the trade, we can just put loads of rubbish on the table to make our trade look good. You might have also seen we could trade the goats away, so getting domesticated animals is worth a decent amount of money yet more reason why they're worth more than humans. Like, a goat's worth 20 trade units, but I can't trade the humans away at all, so they're worthless to me. Again, the, the economy is just demanding that we sacrifice our people to increase the goat population. So overall, my decisions are very economically sound, they are beyond reproach, and the villagers should continue to worship me because I'm just really good at this whole god business. It's going great. Time to empty out the storehouses as we need more value points. And I'm thinking, should I get rid of all the food? We actually don't have that much food right now. It's the perfect time to not give away all of the villagers' possessions in exchange for megalith construction, which is like building with big rocks, something we're not going to be doing at all, really. Megaliths are like a different kind of rock you can find on the map, and I remembered there was one somewhere in the village already. So I was immediately thinking, what can I build out of this rock? We're going to ignore the fact that we have basically no food. Our population's been going up and up, and we haven't really increased our food production. And this is the sort of thing I could usually blame on, like, reporting. We don't have a clear number for, like, how much food we actually need to have in our stockpile to survive the winter. We just sort of play it by ear and try not to let it go down to completely zero. And over time, I need to find a balance somewhere where I'm making the right amount, spending the right amount of labour time making food, and not wasting too much by making food we don't end up eating. There is actually a UI element you can bring up to help with that, so while I'm saying there's no reporting on it, there is some, but I hadn't discovered it quite yet. I was more busy thinking, hey, we could get really big stones and put them on top of each other to make a kind of thing. Or you can just get one big stone and just sort of put it upright in the village and people will worship that, which gives them extra happiness points. So we're moving on from like a skull on a stick. What if the stone was quite big? That's pretty impressive. Maybe we can use that to distract from the sacrifice for goats scheme that's going on in the background. The next clip that I have is of this sheep walking around. I actually don't have the footage of how I got the sheep, which is the thing that would be more interesting to talk about. At some point, I unlocked the ability to make sheep as well as goats, and I think I filmed myself actually getting one because I wanted to see how the domestication worked. And essentially, while we don't have the footage, what happens is your people walk up to the wild animal, they kind of touch it or pat it on the head, and it then walks back to your village as a different animal. And that's how it works in real life. Meanwhile, somebody is getting attacked by a cave hyena. Somebody was just killed by a cave hyena. So yes, there are still lots of people wandering the wild. This is probably the person who just made that sheep. Getting absolutely mauled by a whole bunch of hyenas by the looks of things. And now that's just going to be another problem for our people to deal with because somebody has to go over there and bring back the body and their inventory. Here we actually defeated a wild animal. Looks like whoever that was fighting the wolf probably made this goat which swims away from the scene and then just sits on the riverbank. I think at some point they do walk back to your village and join you once you've converted them. Meanwhile in the village we still have a severe lack of clothing. Our clothing supply is going down and down. I think it's because we hit like a wave of all the clothing we made towards the beginning of the game degrading at a similar time. 
so we're now really low on winter clothing. And it's autumn, we need to do something about that. Killing all these animals out there will actually be helping with that, and getting our villagers killed will be helping with that, that's fewer people who need clothing. There was a defeat against the wolf, we nearly got him that time, nearly. But the real question for me is, what was this person doing in this random location? Who knows? We may be suffering from not only me giving all of these tasks in the middle of nowhere, but the hunt target thing, because I have hunt zones active, the thing where it tags anything that walks through the zone to be hunted. And then if your workload's really high, that thing might actually walk really far away before the hunt task reaches the top of the pile, causing your people to walk really far away and do fewer tasks. And you can perhaps imagine how that can spiral out of control. Not helping is me doing this. I'm constantly seeing goats and being like, ooh, goats. Yes, yeah, somebody captured that at some point, thanks. But of course, doing that is a really long task compared to a lot of other things. Somebody just died of starvation, and this is going to become a recurring theme now. They're not even that far from the village, they're just down the river. What surprised me, I guess, is that your people don't take food with them when they go outside, or outside the village, that is, and they don't... I don't know, like sort of monitor or guess how much hunger bar they need to get to their destination. So if they're not hungry enough to skip the task entirely, they'll go out and start a task. But if the task takes a really long time, such that they are going to die of hunger while doing it, they just kind of do it anyway. And that's a bit of a problem, as you might imagine. Another defeat. Things are going quite bad in our battle with nature at the moment. Early on, we seem to be dominating the lion population, but the hyenas and wolves prove harder to deal with. In this case, though, while our guy doesn't die fighting animals, he does die immediately afterwards because he was also out on a mission dying of hunger. He was trying to pick up a dead goat or something, or a dead mouflon that was nearby, and just didn't have enough hunger bar to actually go there and just died when he got there. Even if he hadn't fought that hyena, he wouldn't have had time to go back afterwards. So I don't know, I'd like to see a little bit more intelligence from these villagers. I think the real solution is, well, you just have to deal with it as God. Try and make it so your people never have to go far from the village, so that this sort of oversight doesn't become too much of an issue. But it does become an issue, and I also feel like it shouldn't be an issue. Like, to some extent, it's our own people's responsibility to keep themselves alive. You know, as a God, I like to impart my subjects with some free will, so that it's not entirely my fault when everything goes wrong. And I feel like my people are abusing this power I've given them to decide, to some extent, whether they live or die, by deciding to die all the time, and it's causing me issues. So now it's come back to me, the buck has to stop here. There, an old woman died on the mountains somewhere far away, and I just started thinking, this is getting absolutely out of control. Why is everybody wandering in the wilderness with no food? Like, we do have a village, guys. You don't have to go out if you're on the verge of death. Can we get, like, a list of tasks where I can decide what tasks should be considered at all costs and be like, do this task even if it costs you your life. Most of the work in the village, if you're gonna die, I don't mind if you just don't do it. I don't know, I need to be more casual, but our people's robotic dedication to randomly achieving tasks is getting them killed. There are actually two mammoths drinking at the river in our village, so all this annoyance about having to go out really far to hunt for animals because we need to make clothes. If we killed those mammoths, we'd probably be fine. Here's another example. I caught someone live in not 4K, walking off, going to get this dead animal that's over here. I cancelled the task, but that's not going to help anymore because that person already had maximum hunger, and they're definitely going to die, essentially. Random note, we have a load of dogs swimming in this lake. Why? I don't know, but lots of the dogs that once lived in our village now live in that lake. Not quite sure what happened there either. Luckily it doesn't matter because dogs actually don't eat food at all in the game, so they can live in the lake as it happens. Now it's time to dig through the menus and be like, right, what is going on? Here's the list of everything your people are doing and what they think they need to do. This is where we need to be able to drag and drop things and be like, only do this today, only do this for this season, that sort of micromanagement level. Well, instead, we're just going to watch people die. So there's somebody going back to the village. They know they need to eat, but they're way too far away, so they'll just die en route. That's good. And of course, people are also going out to get the bodies. 
and each death causes multiple additional people to go out because one person carries the body and two people carry their inventory because they can't equip the stuff at the same time. It takes two to three people to bring somebody's inventory back to the village and that will also get automatically added as a task as well once somebody dies. So lots of people are walking around, there's somebody dying in the village of starvation, all good, and while they're walking around they're not doing the village stuff, they're not doing any of the tasks that are piling up, including getting food. So our workload is now at 200%, and we're in this situation where I can't really solve things, because if you're not performing tasks, more tasks will just keep appearing. Like, your buildings are always degenerating, so if you're not repairing them, you're just constantly adding more tasks to the list. And anything I can do to resolve the situation will basically be adding tasks. Like, we really need more food and clothes, but we're not going to get those without having even more tasks in the task list. And then what I can't do is be like, only do that, please, and just forget building the palisade. Well, there is a way to do that, of course, which is micromanage it even more. But the middle ground wasn't there. It was a nice scenario where we had a couple of people out there. One person died of starvation. The other one was caught eating some meat on the floor nearby. So something was going well out there for those two. What were they doing out there? Who even knows? I probably didn't want them to be out there to the extent that they would actually die yet again. So that's the recurring issue we're having here, and it's getting more and more frustrating, and the situation will just get worse and worse, because all of these extra tasks get added every time somebody dies, and somebody dying means there's less people to do the tasks. Things are getting worse. Here's me finally deciding to be like, okay, I'll cancel the wall. At least that will take some stuff off the list, right? I wasn't sure whether this was actually required, like was it going to be a big deal to cancel the wall, am I going to die because of that? Probably not, but at the time I don't know if I knew that. There's a nice body, almost at the wall's edge, they almost got in. Couple of depressed people wandering back to village, someone's got a stick there or something. This person is going to get some meat, but they're so hungry they will die on the way, that looks good. So that's like the chain of people going out to deal with the bodies that were over there from earlier, and, well, two or three of the people who went out to deal with the previous deaths also died because of that mission, which makes the situation worse. The good news is that the deaths are getting closer and closer to the village. We're starting to get the deaths kind of on the border of the village now, so that's not too far for the kids to go out and drag the stuff back. It should all be quite useful. But yes, the ability to do something about this that isn't like individually micromanaging villages and sort of monitoring people to make sure they don't go outside if they're too hungry and telling them to do something else, that sort of thing. I would like some kind of handle on the situation like that. You actually can micromanage things in extreme detail because you can order specific people to do specific things. It's just that while you're doing that, everybody else might be doing something stupid, so you need to really keep a close eye on people. Here, one of our children goes out to that lake where the dogs live now for some reason and finds some meat underwater, thus preventing her from starving. Why is she out here eating the meat? I just don't know anymore. I presume she walked over here to pick up an inventory item that maybe isn't here anymore because it degraded or something. And now she just has to walk back. There are the dogs having a wild time. Maybe the pathfinding has broken on the dogs and they can't get out of the lake ever, so they're just going to live there forever. They must have gone out there to help somebody hunt something at some point because animals were probably gathering near the lake and someone who got tagged earlier walked over to the lake. You can imagine that happening. Because all of this is happening off camera and without me knowing it while playing, it's a bit frustrating. Like all of these problems sort of occurred without me expecting them to occur. So now that they've occurred, it's a bit frustrating, but more frustrating is that I sort of feel like I should have a way to deal with it. I just can't really give the inputs to the game that I want to make our people deal with it. Back at the village, you can see the little markers over all the tents. Everything's degrading and running out of health. We need to repair everything, but we don't have the materials and manpower to do so. The workload's gone down a little bit so far, but it's still way too much. And we're also pretty low on food. We didn't have a very good spring, in that everybody was so busy, we didn't really plant crops. And of course, we don't have that much animal material to bring in, so we're not going to get much meat. We've got a tiny bit of fish left and a few berries, but aside from that, we're all going to die quite soon. Hey guys, it's God, just letting you know you're all going to die if you don't pull things together pretty soon. Looks like a wolf is mauling one of the kids over towards the farm fields, that's all good. 
I could actually do a bit more about this than I am doing. I was kind of hoping these people here would like intervene. If you don't tell them to intervene, they don't really do it until the last possible second or like until the wolf is right on top of them. They don't notice fights happening and go to join them or anything like that. Part of this weird thing where everybody's kind of acting independently and ignoring each other that I touched on earlier. Well, the good news is we lost a kid who probably wasn't pulling their weight and we killed a whole bunch of wolves and that's going to be skins and meat for us. Exactly what we need. We also at some point did solve the clothing crisis, partially because like 10 to 15 people died. So now we have plenty of clothes available. That's handy. Now I finally snapped and I'm like, right, I'm just going to cancel most of the stuff. There are all those hunt areas I was referring to. You put a little circle down, anything that walks through it, your people will one day hunt it later, and that could be much later, and it could be very far away. So I'm sure that's causing a certain amount of our people to be wandering off to distant locales, such as that lake where the animals must be gathering. Overall, I kind of wanted a way to do this without cancelling everything. It's partially because I'm looking ahead to after the crisis, essentially. Like, after the crisis, I don't want to have to go back through and put all of the zones back in. I want to just say, like, don't do this zone for now until I tell you to go back to it. Which feels a bit easier than removing the zone and then having to remember to put it back a different time. So, a lot of what I want to do can be done in the game, it's just a bit harder than I wanted it to be, and I didn't really make any attempts to do it that way because I just didn't feel like it should work that way, like it almost works the way I imagined it should, and I don't know, maybe it actually does for all I know. There's another victory against a wolf, things are getting a little bit better, somebody is starving here but they're going to a nearby pear tree by the looks of things so maybe they won't die. Maybe this time I shouldn't blame our people in the village for being stupidly hungry, because now there actually is no food. Like, I did that whole rant about, well, you left the village when you were so hungry, it's your fault you died. Turns out that if you stay in the village, you also get hungry. Although that's because of the people being stupid earlier, so maybe it is their fault after all. All we know is that, as the overlord of this village, it's not my fault. And to add insult to our many injuries, the locals are still attacking us. Fortunately, again, they attack through this narrow choke point, which they don't have to come through at all. Well, some of them actually don't come through the narrow choke point, they just stand and look at us. One of our old men goes up and starts slapping them. I think like these guys just glitched out in a very useful to us sort of way. So we pick up a, a couple of free kills. You can steal their weapons, but what you can't do, I think, is steal the clothes of raiders. So you can't deal with clothing issues by taking clothes off the dead. Just a couple of weapons, and you can trade the weapons for clothes in theory if a trader comes by with the right inventory. So maybe we can get what we need out of this. The actual point to make though is that I'm not sure using alert mode is the best idea in this situation because I'm sending the whole able-bodied population of the village to go and stand there and they didn't really need to be there like a lot of our people weren't really participating in the fight and the enemy weren't participating in the fight either so it would have been better to select a few people to kind of hold the enemy off and just deal with them and maybe leave the ones who weren't really attacking to just stand there they'll probably die of hunger eventually. I think more micromanagement from me would actually help out. But again, it would be a little bit hard to do that micromanagement, and it kind of feels like you're not supposed to, like the game's leaning in a different direction. This is my overall comment on my comments here. Like, I have all these comments that are basically, I wanted more control, and the game kind of provides you ways to get that control, but it feels like those ways weren't necessarily intended or you're not supposed to rely on them and well just overall that it would be better if the control was more like a UI that popped up and you just said do these things now because I want you to. I don't want to specifically find a person and tell them to do a task even though that achieves the same thing. I want to just make that task immediate priority and somebody in the village nearby will do it for me and I don't have to look away from the UI. Something like that. Little note here, in the bottom left it says somebody has contracted an infection. I mentioned earlier there isn't really much disease in the game, which was another surprising thing that you'd expect more of. It is technically untrue that there isn't disease in the game. There is disease in the game to get rid of all of those double negatives. It just doesn't really do very much. Now and again somebody gets sick. I'm guessing this reduces their stats and they eventually recover. I think their health bar just ticks down a certain amount and if the disease wears off before they die, they're considered to not have died of the disease and it's fine. I don't remember people dying of disease and generally it wasn't a big issue. You might expect that living in squalor like this would have the disease there, but you could argue that it's vaguely simulated in the background because your people don't really reproduce very much and you don't have many children. 
We can abstract away all of the disease and infant mortality by just saying all the stuff that didn't happen in the village, that's sort of representing what you wouldn't have been able to do because of disease and then we won't uh, won't bother showing the disease. Does anyone know what I mean by that? Like your village has less going on in it, but what is going on is like what would be left over if there was a constant disease mechanic thinning people out at a realistic in the wild rate. Maybe it's easier to manage this way because if you imagine like a household, like a household in the game will add like two people maybe over the course of its lifetime, over the course of the campaign, because reproduction doesn't happen very much. So if you abstract that into labor hours, it's like this house expanded our labor hours pool by say like 2000 or something. And this is the same amount it would have expanded if the house had actually produced 25 more people but like 17 of them died as children and the rest got ill partway through their life and didn't provide all of their man hours. It adds up to the same number. So we can abstract everything away, remove disease as a mechanic and remove the high mortality rate to make things a little bit more upbeat and just say, like your family only produce one additional person over the course of your village's history because that's the amount of work that was done in game. Who knows what I mean? I think I have a point once again. So, 20% of the village died, there's a labour shortage, there's a food shortage, what are we going to do? Well, the first big breakthrough was clicking this here. The whole repair task queue is added automatically, but you can disable the repair for buildings, meaning they just won't be repaired. This will actually give you a little bit more life out of the buildings, because they still somewhat function while almost destroyed. I think they reach a point when, when once their health is really low, people can't live in them. But hey, here's the good news. Tons of people died and we have more houses than we need. So it doesn't really matter if we let the houses degrade. And removing a lot of the repair tasks actually got our workload under control really fast. A lot of the stuff people were trying to do was gather stuff to repair the tents, which was using up all of our animal skins and stuff. So now we have surplus skins, we have surplus labor, and the food situation, while remaining bad, is scraping along the bottom of the survival barrel because I've got extra people to do loads of fishing. This doesn't scale up, you can't like just use your whole population to do fishing to get fish because the number of fish in the river goes down very quickly and regenerates slowly. So I'm just taking all the fish I can right now and we have enough people to do a little bit of hunting. We were lucky in that this flock of boars came and stood right next to the village, so it's safe enough to go out and fight them, even if they run away a little bit, our people probably won't run too far away. You can see the river is completely depleted of fish all over the place, we just ate like all the fish anywhere near the village. There are still some more further away, but they get harder and slower to get, so maybe at some point it's worth actually taking the nearly depleted stocks just right by the village to cut down on the logistics time. I don't know. The point being, we actually didn't quite run out of food. We did scrape along the bottom, as I said. We just had very small amounts of food throughout the winter. And this is where we have the great opportunity to make a very rhetorical point that, hey guys, we almost ran out of food. Imagine how little food we would have had if everybody else was still alive. All those people who used to live here, they would have eaten us all into an early grave. The kind of argument where actually everybody is at fault, that wouldn't have happened. But rhetorically speaking, you can make it sound like this was like the perfect way for us to get through the situation and that actually all of those sacrifices did mean something and weren't due to a number of user errors from God and just the incompetence of people in general. I think we're all to blame to some extent, but what we can do is spin this so that it looks like it was all part of my plan. I'm really getting into this God business. Now once spring comes about, it's time to really focus down on getting out of this hole. We're going to spend as much time as we can getting the crops in. We can prioritize the task of planting the crops to make sure they actually go through and people don't get distracted by other things. But just having the workload be low, I think, is also the key to that. So still not repairing the village is helping us out. Instead of repairing, we're building new things. Check this out. We've now got a new economy strand using the fact that we have sheep and the goats in fact. We have the goats producing milk from which you can make cheese which you can store in the long term as a long term food source although I tended to never really get any because I wasn't producing enough. But more importantly the sheep give you infinite supplies of wool. This allows us to weave cloth and make winter clothes with no more 
like wild animals being involved in the economy. So that's going to be a great long-term boon. You could even sell them as well because they're worth a lot of trade points. Here we finally reached another milestone. I mentioned earlier it's going to get harder and harder to get these things. There were more and more gaps between me actually achieving things. But things should speed up now because the economy is actually in a good place after all the death once again. We've got some animals. We're going to have infinite milk. We're going to have infinite wool. With enough labour to be put into those industries, we can get loads, loads of food, loads of clothes. We won't have the starvation and hypothermia issues we were suffering from earlier. And all of the skins that saves can go into repairing the tents and stuff and generally just being useful. The other thing is that I'm going to change my ways as the lord of this village. I started to become more conservative, I guess, about letting people go outside. <laughs> we're going to be stricter about this. And also on myself, I'm trying to keep the camera as close to the village as possible because not only do I not want my people to get lost, I don't want to get lost. By keeping the camera close to the village, we're going to remember where the village is, for one, and it prevents me from giving my people tasks that are going to take them far from the village. And look at this luck. Right after I invented pig domestication, a bunch of boars are standing around right outside the village, basically the only animal that's nearby. So this will give us an opportunity to basically as soon as we could get some pigs in the village. And also going out in the summer is a great idea because there's less to do. Although it's the end of summer so we're about to hit harvest. Not the ideal time but still. It's an okay time for people to be running about the fields chasing pigs. And the other thing is that our people like running about the fields chasing pigs. They don't want to bother doing the harvest and stuff. So they're probably having a grand old summer time. The dogs went out with them. I just think they're having a, a lovely time out there. And again I'll take the credit for that. Although I did choose Asgard to give some pestilence to the village apparently because some of the plants have diseases. I mentioned this before. The plants get diseases more frequently than the animals or people and it just straight up kills them instantly so there's not much you can do about it. The way to get around it is to just have lots of different kinds of plants so they're unlikely to all get the same disease at the same time or just have loads of plants so that even if half the crop dies off every year there's still enough going around. So obviously now it's autumn, it's time for the boring part of our people's daily lives. They need to go back and actually harvest the plants. This is a nice like real life style bottleneck that comes up because it's quite easy to plant enough crops to go way beyond what you need food wise. But it takes a lot of manpower to turn the crops into something useful by the end and there's a time limit. If you don't take them in quickly they just die. So. This reminds me of real life where like it used to be a really big deal to have people around for harvest and you get this sort of campaigning season style vibe where you need to try and make sure people only leave the village and do things that take a long time during the summer so people are ready to go during the autumn. And by the looks of our workload we're just about getting it right. If we're just over the workload limit then I guess we don't quite have enough people to do everything that needs to be done and that includes taking the crops. But this is okay, this is okay. It's much better than last year, guys, at the very least. Here, actually, is some footage of the domestication process happening. I finally caught it on camera. What it actually involves is somebody goes and just kind of has a chat with this pig. This wild boar, this juvenile boar, simply listens to your arguments. Your people gesticulate and speak in the boar language that they probably know. And after a while, the boar will be convinced to join your tribe. And this is where they just sort of change species or change breed into something else. They are now a pig instead of a boar and they'll just do their own thing. Eventually they'll wander back to one of your stables and be in the village. Get enough of them and they'll start reproducing in your village. Boom, you have infinite animals. Although you need to make sure that as you're increasing your animal population, you're also increasing your farming field output because they eat the straw and even the grain coming out of your agricultural production. So you do need to pay more attention to the food supply once you're adding animals that actually eat food, unlike the dogs. And there is a system for monitoring that in-game and controlling your animal population. We'll see more of that later. For now, looks like I'm still on the prowl. This pig's kind of far away, but maybe it's worth still trying to get it. It's really hard to judge, like, can I get that before winter? This guy looks like he's kind of hungry and he's really far from the village. We have to start thinking, like, and we've learned some lessons here. Should I tell people to go to bed or something? Can I even tell them to just go to bed and stop doing work out here? 
not quite sure. My solution, as you can see, is just trust. I believe in my people. I've given them that free will. They won't kill themselves, even though half the time they do. Basically, as long as it's not my fault, it's fine. And people's lives are quite cheap in the village, realistically, so I can com complain and criticize myself for letting them die. It doesn't actually matter. Like humans, we can just get more of those. My position as somebody who isn't human makes me very callous towards the humans. I think the humans should rule themselves, really, because then they'll make decisions that are sort of pro-human. Like, I'm here, I'm more kind of pro-economy. Like, I'm just trying to get some milestones here, and the people are just tools to me to achieve my goals. It actually brings to mind a potential really annoying game mechanic you could add, where your, your people develop a culture or religion that isn't about listening to you. They're like, well, things haven't gone very well, so we're not going to follow God's will anymore. We'll do more of our own thing. And they start just like putting buildings wherever they want or something. That could be a very entertaining but extremely frustrating mechanic to put in. I don't know. Trying to sort of think about how I can integrate the fact that I have developed a God complex by playing Dawn of Man with the game itself. Well, looks like we're now actually going to repair some tents back here. We're going to start putting this village back together. The council is finally filling in the potholes of this village. Maybe the crisis is over. Once the harvest is in, we've got a certain amount of grain. Is it the right amount? Well, probably not. But we can now supplement our supply with pulses. We've unlocked pulse domestication. That means a different kind of plant whose seeds you can eat. But more importantly... They operate on a different seasonal cycle, which is going to be bad news for my people, actually. When you plant pulses, they go down in the winter and come up in the summer. So it works perfectly in tandem with regular grains going down in the spring and coming up in the autumn. For our people, that means non-stop labour. You are always harvesting or planting something every season. It's over for these people and their hatred of agriculture. There is actually a way in the late game to get over people's hatred of agriculture, which we'll see later. For now, they're just going to have to be miserable. And, well, I wasn't really paying attention to how miserable they were, of course, because I'm a loving god of all things. But hopefully it's not too much of a debuff. The point is, we're going to get so much food out of this system. I don't care if you're miserable. At least you're alive. And that's really my job, to keep you somewhat alive. Except, of course, when it's easier to replace you as I already explained. Well, I don't have any responsibilities whatsoever, I think that's what I'm saying. During the winter, somebody shows up to attack and we see the advantage of a half-built defensive line. I never finished this wall over here. However, I believe the way the AI works is it kind of senses where your defenses are and tries to attack through them. So even though they don't have to come through this gate, like the only place in our entire perimeter we are guarding, they do anyway. So we end up fighting them, like they could have just gone slightly to the side and gone through the gaps in the wall, or attacked from any other of the 360 degrees of possible attack vector on our village and been absolutely fine. I think there's probably something to be said for just making a bunch of gates here and there, because the AI will be attracted to the gates thinking, ooh, that's the way in, in some way ignoring the much easier ways in that not going through the gate provides. One of our soldiers died on the way back of old age. Like, I would be fine if there were some settings where you could decide who counts as a soldier when it comes to calling people up to fight. I don't want to send the people who are literally so old, they're going to die in three minutes, to go and be a spear bearer on the front line. It's really not that desperate. There was only like four guys attacking us back there. Well, anyway, we get somebody killed, probably from the stress of battle for no reason. But apart from that, everything's going well. And of course, people dying isn't a sign that things aren't going well, as we've already explained. We now have a constant food economy. We've got grains and pulses coming in all the time. And we're not starving. Our population can now start going up again. And all I'm going to do is just add more and more plants, because we might as well, essentially. As long as there's a bit of spare labour each season, might as well plant some more stuff. Even if you don't harvest it, it's nice to have the option to harvest it there once the time comes. It does mean dedicating more and more space to this, which doesn't really matter. The only real reason to have loads of space around your town is either A, you plan to expand it massively, which isn't really required as it turns out by the end game, or B, you want to have more efficient lumber production. You want lots of spaces within your fortification just to grow trees so you can have a supply of wood. Well, 
We're going to mainly take our wood from outside the village, which is slow, but it's fine. There's plenty of space out there. The map's absolutely gigantic, as I said, so there's always going to be more trees growing than you can take down, realistically. There goes another raiding party. We've actually finished off this palisade over here, but obviously that makes no difference whatsoever. So at this stage, walling off the town is almost just like an aesthetic choice. It looks safer to have the town walled off, but I'm never going to close the gates because we seem to fight better with the gates open. And the enemy love going to the gates anyway, so at least that simplifies matters. Basically, it's been like a year or two since the Stone Age crisis, and things are suddenly really good, because we just unlocked those texts that give us extra food supply. We now have loads of food. I'm even telling people to not leave the village to kill that mouflon. We don't need to, because also in the background our animal population will have been growing. So we'll have plenty of animals to just eat whenever we please, and they're producing animal products as well. And with our surplus labour that comes about now and again, we can do semi-pointless things, like drag this stone across the environment. This is the megalith thing I unlocked earlier, where you can make certain special buildings if you have certain special stones, and there are a finite number of those special stones across the world, and the more you want to use them, the further away you'll have to go to get them, and you really slowly drag them back into town. Looks like I'm confident enough now to use my food as money, so the food supply is clearly going well, I've decided I don't need that amount. Obviously in the background I'm making sort of arbitrary judgments about how much food our village seems to eat each year, so I can know how much to give away. We'll see the UI for that at some point, I'm sure. There's the stone, we've set up the stone, it's just sort of a big stone uprighted into the ground, but that counts as a building. We get some knowledge, we get some prestige, something we'll see more of later. And we now have a new project in mind. We've also unlocked some better megalith stuff. We can make a Stonehenge type thing. We only need to decide where to put it. There's an obvious place for it right here, but I'm not putting it there because I had something else in mind that's going to come in the future. Some actual planning happening here in a revolutionary twist. I wanted to put the Stonehenge somewhere kind of pointless. However, it is a religious building that your people will visit, so you don't want it to be far away from things because then they'll waste tons of labour time going to visit it. No wasting labour time, people! I'm sure with proper planning you could leave a big space in the middle of your village from the beginning to set up stuff like that for ultimate efficiency. Now we do have enough knowledge to unlock copper, like we don't even have to be in the Stone Age anymore. I'm deliberately holding my people back by not letting them find out about copper. Why? Well, there's actually a good reason to do this, but I was doing it for a less good reason. At first I thought, I want to storm into the Copper Age, like I want to unlock the Copper Age and also have knowledge left over to unlock the Copper Age techs and just start building everything all at once and just suddenly jump up. But the game actually tells me here there is a better reason not to advance too quickly. Essentially, the raider attacks are of a strength vaguely proportional to your technology level. So if you jump up to the Copper Age, the raiders will suddenly have copper weapons and armour, and it tells me there that I need to fortify my village before doing it. So I decided to not advance when I had the chance here, and think like, well, okay, I guess I'll fortify the village. Again, it's still a very difficult task because of how passable the mountains are to people on foot, which is what the raiders are going to be. We can wall off anything we want, but walling off the entire village, like actually making it be cut off from the rest of the world in terms of pathfinding, is virtually impossible. The good news is the AI is too stupid to take advantage of that, so here comes another attack a bit later. We've got this watchtower that can shoot over our open gate in this tiny section of the village, which is extremely difficult to attack, but the AI likes to do it anyway. I think the way it works is it decides vaguely what direction the raiders are coming from and then it looks for the nearest gate to that and attacks that gate. So maybe if there's like no gate facing a 90 degree angle anywhere, they will just come through the gaps and just enter the village. But it just doesn't seem to be that way, so we really get away with things there, and I kind of feel like maybe the game would be too annoying if the AI was playing this cleverly, but also the sort of stupidity of the attacks makes them kind of trivial, and at the same time I think, well, I don't even really want this to be in the game because it's just like this random little thing you do that seems to barely affect things, like just don't even put it in at this stage. I don't know, like, it seems like it's the beginning of something, probably needs like massive changes to be a real involved mechanic in some way. It's a bit weird. Well, I tried to fortify the village a bit more, so it's now more walled off than it was before, 
And as we saw, we've gone into the Copper Age, and I immediately, boom, grab the donkey and the wheel. I was very enthusiastic about getting wheels, because I was like, well, the reason our village's productivity is low is because everybody carries things in their hands, and at best they have like a sled. If somebody could invent the wheelbarrow around here, we'd be a million times more productive. Like, even just one wheel with like a plank of wood, like balanced on top of it, that's gonna do something. I think it's called the Chinese wheelbarrow or something, where you just take like a square plank of wood, cut a gap in the middle and shove a wheel through that. This thing, ultra easy to make, can let you carry tons of stuff. You could even put two wheels on it and make a cart, and that's what the wheel actually unlocks in the game, the cart. However, the cart can only be pulled by donkeys, horses, and maybe cattle as well. So you have to have large working animals to use the cart. You can't make a small cart for the people to drag things around. And that's what I was really thinking of. So anyway, obviously to unlock the wheel, we also unlocked donkey domestication. So it's time for God to go out on another adventure and try to find where wild donkeys are so we can bring some of them in. While I get on with that, I wanted to throw in one more random topic rant. This topic is sustainability, and this is something that I thought about throughout the campaign. Like, for example, just now, or just before this, I could have just never advanced to the Copper Age and stayed in my Stone Age paradise forever because I was just generating resources. Your population never goes above the amount you can sustain. Well, actually, it never goes above your chosen amount, I should say, because... I think if you have full housing, you'll never get any immigrants and you'll never get any new births. So, you could theoretically set up a kind of sustainable system where it's just people, you've got a set amount of people, generating a set amount of food, and it's fine. However, this doesn't actually work because of the unsustainable nature of how some of your tools are produced. By the way, this rant that I'm about to make isn't really a criticism of the game at all. It's just something I was thinking about while playing, so now I'm going to force you to think about it as well. So take what's going on towards the bottom right of the screen right now, for example. I think I planted a whole bunch of flax. So flax is another domesticated plant which you can use to make linen, which basically makes clothes. So we have an infinite supply of clothes there, right? Well, not necessarily, because while you do have infinite flax, the harvesting process requires you to use tools that degrade with each use. And right now we're using flint tools, and we're going to be moving on to using like copper and metal tools, but both avenues have the same problem in that there is a finite supply of flint and metals around your town. The actual amount of flint and metals on the map is gigantic, it's just impractical to harvest most of it so we're really just focusing on what's like within a hunger bars walking distance of the town well better than that ideally because you want them to spend some time actually at the mine before they come back so what am i complaining about to me the chillness of the game is negatively impacted by the fact that as i watch my economy tick over i'm like this just has to stop at some point. Like, we can't live like this forever. We can't keep harvesting crops because it's using a non-renewable resource, that being, like, stones, which is a bit of a strange thing to be running out of. Like, we're not degrading the topsoil. We're just running out of things to use to actually cut the plants down after they grow. And, well, this bothered me. This doesn't matter at all. At all, even slightly. Because not only do you have a decent amount of these resources... You can even get sort of trickles of supplies from off-map in that the trader will sometimes have a few of the resources you need to make some tools. So if your population isn't too big, it probably is sustainable because there is an infinite supply of certain resources coming in through the trading system. So it is possible to be sustainable in that you can trade infinite resources for the quote-unquote not infinite, the nearly infinite resources <laughs> such as copper, which technically would run out. Why am I worried about this? Because I'm crazy. Like, if, in theory, you ran your town for a really long time, it will always collapse. That's the thing that I was, like, concerned about. Because, I don't know, I'm thinking about the long term, because, theoretically, that, like, Stone Age thing we went through, like, in real life, the Stone Age was, like, 500,000 years or something. I don't know exactly what it's defined as. But it's like 99% of human history was the Stone Age. However, in the game, it bothered me that the Stone Age economy will give out. Like, if you played the game for 100 in-game years, your village would collapse due to, like, 
just resource depletion. It's like we need a more sustainable method. I think what I'm actually asking for here between all of the crazy rants is I wanted there to be more flint. It's just the flint again, it's really getting to me. Like we can't make an economy that's based on flint and all of the other things we get theoretically deplete this relatively scarce resource. I mean, flint was the only thing I actually like ran out of and couldn't really mine near the village anymore by the end. So I don't know, flint's a sticking point for me. You can actually use bone tools to do a lot of the stuff that flint does. And bones are a theoretically infinite resource because you can get bones from animals that spawn from off map, like animals spawn in the environment. I think I noticed it's like during winter, the animals kind of go away and in spring, they just pop back when you're not looking at them. Like sometimes I would rotate the camera by the village and suddenly there'd be loads of animals just sitting there. I think there's some sort of spawn window where they just can appear and it's probably during the spring. So with that, you can get a certain infinite supply of bones, thus calming me down one rung on the ladder, maybe. Maybe it's possible in-game to make a Stone Age economy that you could just run in the game forever without the village collapsing. I don't know, I'm just going crazy, of course. Like, when I say sustainable, like, it basically is sustainable to use, like, copper tools because there's copper absolutely everywhere. It would be difficult to use it all up just making tools. Look, there are some donkeys. We found some in the end. I'm just talking at this stage. You can go. I'm just warming up my voice as usual. The thing I wanted to say next was that this whole sustainability rant reminds myself of back in university, actually. I mentioned already how I'm lording it up over my people because I went to university. Therefore, I should be god of this village. Well, here's something I actually learned in university. I did physics. And as part of that, there was this course called something like energy in the environment or something like that, which was essentially applied physics to like how to make human civilization sustainable, which is why I have a complex about this. And one thing they were doing is saying like, well, what is sustainable anyway? Because people call wind turbines sustainable. Like you actually can't infinitely get power from wind turbines because they're made out of something we have a finite supply of and they break. They consume the resources they're made of in their operation. So you can't just keep doing it. Therefore, it's not quote unquote sustainable. And this is exactly the sort of annoying thing that I'm struggling with in Dawn of Man for some reason. And the definition they, they came to in that course was like, well, just say, if you could do it for a thousand years, that counts as sustainable because that's far enough in the future that like, well, civilization will probably end by then anyway, so it doesn't matter anymore. Like, is it possible to get enough like rare earth materials or rare earth minerals to make enough solar panels to run civilization for 500 years? If so, We'll call it sustainable, even though if you did it, that in itself would destroy civilization by removing all of those resources. So, is my village sustainable by this sort of cynical physics definition, which just assumes that civilization must be destroyed in the near future? Maybe, but I was hoping to escape the reality, I guess, of civilization being destroyed in the near future. I wanted my Stone Age village, my little civilization here, to last forever. How can that be possible? I need more copper. I need more flint. I'm turning into an orc. I don't know. For some reason, I was really bothered in the background. And I found that it conflicted with the relaxing nature of the game. For me to be worrying about the fact that every time I started a copper mine, I was like, I wonder how long that's going to last. Like, every time you look at your village, it's like, I wonder how long that's going to last. And to somebody who sort of trained in the ways of being a doomer, who looks out the window at civilization and thinks, I wonder how long that's going to last. I don't want that to happen in this game as well, okay? I'm playing this game on a computer that's made of various resources that are going to be increasingly hard to come by in the future. In a thousand years, it probably will not be possible to play Dawn of Man. So for now, since I'm one of the few humans to exist throughout this million year human history, who even has the potential to play Dawn of Man, I want it to be the best damn Dawn of Man experience ever. <laughs> Do it for them. Do it for the 10 billion people who died to get me here playing Dawn of Man. Make Dawn of Man have more raw resources in it. That's what I'm coming down to with this enormous, gigantic, grandiose rant. We're all gonna die, so can't you just give me some more flint in Dawn of Man? Thank you very much. I was having a very hard time yesterday. I'm fine now, look how rich I am. I'm gonna trade all my stuff away for some rye domestication, from which you can make beer later. That's handy. If we have enough beer, it doesn't matter that we're going to run out of copper and have to just eat each other eventually. 
Right? Right, we're all agreed. Here comes another attack, and you can see for this one I've prepared some defensive platforms. You can put platforms behind your walls to allow your people to shoot over them, similar to the watchtowers, but they have a bit more capacity and they're cheaper, I think. However, I wasn't so sure that platforms are a good idea in the end, because ever since I built the platforms, you can see the attacks go slightly differently. The enemy doesn't run through your gate. They come up towards the platforms and either shoot at people on them, or they even attack the walls now. I'm not sure if this is a development coming from the age advancing and the en enemy AI gets better or something like that. Or is it just the platforms? It kind of widens the aggro area of the enemy so they don't try to come through your gates so much. And therefore, the fights are spread out and just kind of don't involve your people so much. I want the enemy to charge through my gates because the default orders are for everybody to group up behind the gate. So... If we stand there shooting at each other, most of our people actually aren't doing anything and our DPS will be bad. Well, something's going on there. Here you can see my animal population is through the roof. It's actually over the limits I told my people to keep it at for the pigs here. And it's causing issues. We don't have enough space to keep all of our pigs. Our people are supposed to be killing them, but maybe because our workload is too high, they're not doing it. It's another case where I wanted to prioritize doing this because we're about to hit winter and all of these extra pigs will be eating food during the winter. You don't have to feed your animals in the other seasons, only during winter. And also they take up space in stables. And if there's not enough space, which is the case right now, then random animals will stay outside during winter and will die. Therefore, we need to kill off these pigs. I don't know if I could select a few villagers and right click on some pigs and be like, well, do something about the pigs. You can see the automated system just isn't there, and that's what I really want to do rather than have to micro it. We've got a few people just standing around doing nothing. The workload is over 100%. So this makes me feel like, in my imagination of how the automated system works, that everybody is always doing something with all of the time in which they could be doing something and aren't attending to their needs. However, that's not even the case, so even at 100%, some people will just do nothing, and that's what I was trying to avoid. I guess it doesn't work like that, and only by looking closely can we notice it. We also need more clothes for the winter. We've got the clothing production on high priority, but again, there's just not enough stuff going on here. Like, I need like more people to be paying attention to this. Maybe again, because the workload is too high. The other option would be to build more clothing production buildings to persuade the AI to pay more attention to it versus other things, because it would be more of the total tasks on the list. But that feels like a silly workaround. I want to make the most of the one building I have already, ideally. So more trouble there. Here I am, getting rid of the pigs in another way. We can trade them away because a trader happens to come by. We can get some copper instead. That'll be very useful. You also saw earlier I had a pile of stones ready to make my stone henge. I needed one more stone to be brought in, and soon it is in because it was just like around the corner. We've made ourselves a nice henge here in the corner, a stone circle. You get a bunch of knowledge for not only building the stone circle, but completing an objective. That was one of the goals of this campaign scenario. I think it's to make a few different megalith structures. They just build stuff out of big rocks now and again. And you get that one. So there it is. We're like 70% of the way through the game at this stage. Still a bunch of harder things to do. I also wanted to make a defensive platform here on this wall. But it's difficult because I haven't built the wall completely flat. So I needed to basically pay attention to that earlier when I was making the walls and think about whether I'd want these platforms. But again, I'm not completely convinced that having them is a good idea because it felt like the AI was more exploitable back when we didn't have them. Well, winter is here. We didn't kill the pigs. We don't have enough stable space. Everyone's busy now because they have to plant all of those winter crops and they can go and complain about that. But, well, the economy is looking good. At least we've got loads of stuff up in the top left. And we're about to solve our pig problem the old-fashioned way through divine intervention, yes? The pigs got some kind of pig disease in the next year, and a certain amount of them will die of this. It's the thing I mentioned earlier where their health bar continually declines. If they had enough health, whatever that means, before the disease struck, they will survive getting it. And this allows us to kill off something like 10 pigs in the end, which was roughly how many I needed to get rid of to bring me back to the chosen pig limit. That's something, and you can also eat the dead pigs that die of disease. So, it's a boon, it's feast time, things are back on track animal-wise. What I eventually did with the animal thing 
was essentially set the limits lower than I wanted them to be to try and encourage the villagers to kill our animals more liberally and prevent them from growing out of control. But it's a strange thing, like, a year has passed since I wanted those animals to be killed, and they still hadn't been killed. Only by disease do they finally start dying off. So that's just an example of how things sometimes just don't happen if the workload capacity isn't there. And I'd love to be able to set slaughtering animals to like a high priority in a big list of how important each task is, so that when tasks of that kind come up, it's being put near the front of the list. So things like planting crops and killing animals will be higher, and then things like repairing buildings or chopping down trees will be lower. And even if it's still kind of vague, still kind of random, like there's just a chance somebody will do a task that's high in the list, it would vaguely steer you towards getting the economy more on track. It's again a problem with free will. All gods learn this at one point or another. If you give your people free will, they will mess it up. And I think what you have to do in real life and in this game is just learn to love them anyway. To be an all-loving god, you have to deal with the fact that your creations kind of suck, and you kind of like brought that on yourself. You gave them the ability to cause themselves to suck, like as a present, and they used it. They made themselves suck, and you have to deal with that. Just live with it, okay? We're gonna have too many pigs. There's gonna be no straw. Like, we're constantly running out of straw because the animals are eating it all. It's a problem. Whatever. You know what? It's the Bronze Age, everyone. It's time for a real Metal Age. Like, the Copper Age? I don't know. That barely feels like a Metal Age at all. And in-game, it actually doesn't really matter, the Copper Age. For a simple and strange reason, actually, which I'll show you in a second. First, here's me just lining up how to actually get some bronze. It's a combination of copper and tin. Luckily, copper and tin mines are all over the place, or sites where you can build them. So we have a few people just in a hole in the ground, bringing us copper and tin. You have a big mud oven that cooks them together, making some delicious bronze. What do we do with it? We smith it into the various tools. So it's just a chance to upgrade all of the tool lines in the game. And on the topic of upgrades, this is where bronze matters and copper doesn't. You can see each thing has like a number of stats, but they're out of like three or four. And because there are like seven, I forget, like several more than that upgrade tiers available. Many of the tiers don't do anything. So some of the copper tools, or I think all of the copper tools, I can't quite remember, have the same stats as the line that came before them. Often there's like one thing on each tier which is better. So like maybe a copper axe is better than a flint axe, but a copper sickle isn't better than a flint sickle. And a flint sickle isn't better than a bone sickle. Like it goes back a couple of tiers before the score actually goes down in some cases. That means quite a lot of the upgrades, I might go so far as to say most of the upgrades, actually don't do anything. And it's more about just changing the resources you're using. So in that way, using copper instead of flint is better because it's easier to get copper than flint, even though the actual performance of the tools and the effect on your economy is zero. At least it says that it's zero, maybe it actually isn't. There we can see on the left, various things going extinct. This was a fun little feature. As you go through the ages, animals that stopped existing actually stopped existing in the world. The only thing there is you kind of wish maybe it was more dynamic. Like the implication is that the kinds of thing that go extinct are human prey animals. So it's stuff that we quote unquote hunted to extinction. But in game, we didn't do that because we long ago just left the animals be and I've banned our people from going outside, as I mentioned earlier. So we're not really touching the natural world that much. We just go out to cut down trees once a year and then let the rest regrow. We're kind of chilling inside the walls at the moment. I'd like to see it so that you could get to the Iron Age and there's still like a mammoth out there because you just didn't kill the mammoths on the map. Like maybe you have to kill a certain amount of something to drive it to extinction. Something like that. There was one other thing that I didn't mention because I was ranting before that has happened in our village, so I'll mention it now. We domesticated trees at some point, so some of the trees inside the village limits are orchards rather than natural trees. They provide you with an infinite supply of fruit and stuff. Trees are very simplistic in the game, like many things, where you just plant them and like two years later they're fully grown and they'll just infinitely produce their thing e.g. like pears and chestnuts, I think there's some other things you could get as well. 
And again, it just makes you think of like a different way of doing it that's more like how trees work in real life, which is my comment on many things in this game, really. Like maybe you'd have to plant them and it's a really long time investment before you actually start getting something back from it. But once you get it, it's a really low labor, low effort, low maintenance way to get food, but like just a passive small amount of food in the background because it's not as space efficient as growing grain and making flour with the same amount of area. Since you can essentially do that like 30 times before the tree even starts to provide you with any food. So, I don't know, they just work like normal crops and they feel overpowered. Trees are OP. Although that said, I don't think you can use them to get wood. I'm not sure about that. It feels like there'd be a cycle where, like, in the start of their life they don't provide you with anything. In the middle, they provide you with whatever it is that their fruits are. And then at the end, they kind of die off and you cut them down to get a supply of lumber. So you could have something going on where your entire village is ringed by orchards of that kind, with people constantly going out to collect either the wood or the food it's providing. However, they're more just like plants that you just sort of harvest from like their herbs or something like that. So, trees OP. I actually ranted about trees for so long that we've got in the footage to the next thing happening, We've got the next milestone, which was to get bronze, essentially. An alloy. We've done it sometimes. The weird rocks which melt if you put them over fire. You could, like, melt several of them at the same time, and they kind of, like, mix together and make new things. What's up with that? Turns out if you try it with loads of different rocks, a couple of them, after melting, solidify into cool stuff. In both senses of the word. I feel like I'm coming across to my people as very unimpressed with their efforts because I'm like this high and mighty god. Like, they're like, my lord, we've invented bronze. Like, we went through all the effort of melting down all these stones and stuff and like trying different combinations of materials because like, I guess in real life there would be many more materials than just tin and copper to try it with. It would take a while and you need a food surplus to even bother doing this and sort of the social permissibility to have people not doing labour, to just do semi-pointless things like melting rocks to see what happens. And well, they feel like they've achieved something, but I'm like, guys, did I ever tell you that I went to university? Like, I already knew something about this. I got this vague idea that you can melt a couple of rocks down and make other things, and you put them in moulds, and it's, it's kind of useful. You can make stuff in the shape that you want relatively easily. That's nice, isn't it? And I'm, I'm just so unimpressed with these people. You guys don't even have a PC that can run Dawn of Man. Come back to me later, Bronze Age. Get over yourself, people in my village. The thing that really makes a difference in the Bronze Age is that you can unlock masonry, which allows you to build things using stone. I say masonry, it's not really masonry, it's more like dry stone walling, I guess. We haven't invented mortar or anything like that, or stone working. Maybe the bronze tools could be used for stone working, but what you can do is take all the stones around the place and put them in a big pile. That allows you to make dry stone walls. So we can wall off our town in a more official looking way. Now it's really walled off. This only really matters because the enemy can theoretically attack your wall, so now it has more health. It's just that in practice it doesn't. So really, this is a huge waste of labour, like this won't do anything. But then again, maybe it's just the peace of mind. Like, if you make a wall and it never gets attacked, in many ways that means the wall worked, right? It did what you wanted, it stopped you getting attacked. Something, something, I have a rock that prevents tigers from attacking me, see there are no tigers attacking me. Something like that. We can justify it to our people, like they probably don't like hauling the rocks around, but well, whatever. As for the rocks themselves, I mentioned earlier that stones are surprisingly hard to come by. They're just like official piles of stones in the environment. What you can't do is take stones from outside of those piles. So you might think our people could probably find something that's like heavier than wood to use to make the walls, because the environment appears to be made out of stuff that's heavier than wood. But you can't quarry, that's the big thing you can't do, whereas you can mine, so it feels like a tiny bit of an inconsistency there. So stone is actually a surprisingly finite resource. You might not want to waste it, stone walling off your town, especially because, as we see here in this battle, the enemy prefer to just fight over your open gates, especially if you just leave them open, and that does seem to be a good way of dealing with things, and I kind of regret making these platforms for the ranged attacks, because it just encourages the enemy to make ranged attacks against you, because they can see you over the wall rather than coming through the gate. And there was one enemy there actively fighting the wall, so they were making an effort to break in, 
Probably wouldn't have made a difference if they did break in, because we could just move over there and fight at that gap, rather than the official gap we were already fighting in. But I was clearly paranoid enough to be like, all right, that's it. I'm going to completely replace this wall with a stone wall, going to use all of our stone resources. We totally don't have the workload capacity to do this. We're just going to do it anyway. We're also going to be hoping, of course, that the enemy keep attacking here specifically. They did tend to attack the same couple of places over and over again, which helps us just focus our defense in one spot, which is nice. You might have noticed a trader walking through that battle, and that trader gave us brewing. So now we can make beer. Beer is the official solution to all of the misery I'm inflicting on my people, because they can just drink beer and it automatically replenishes their morale. So... That means when they're really miserable doing farming and hauling rocks all over the place, which is all I want them to do these days, they can drink the beer, they'll be fine. The only problem is it looks like there's no space to actually put the brewing thing down. Obviously, we want everything to be really close together for logistical purposes, but that does mean that we're running out of space. So I was kind of guessing like how many things I would have to eventually build. We kind of got it to all fit vaguely together in the middle of the village overall. Our village would be a utopia if it wasn't for me. Like, our economy is so strong. We have so much food. Like, people don't really have to do any work in this town. Like, we're easily producing all the stuff that we need. People could just chill, but I'm all over them all the time. I did sometimes let them, like, hang out at, like, 30% workload. I think it does actually benefit your people to do that. But, yeah, I also kept intervening to be like, can we stonewall off this area and check it out? This guy here just walks straight through the wall system, completely ignoring it, just proving that it doesn't do anything. Like, those bits to the sides of the wall, they are passable, but you can't build on them. So you can't wall off your town. But you can pretend to, and it seems to work insofar as the AI attackers don't really notice how easy it is to bypass your wall system, and that's the only reason it seems to work. Back in the village, we've upgraded our first hut into a roundhouse. A better hut, for all intents and purposes. You use stone instead of mud to make it, so that's probably going to last a bit longer. Looks like Balmek out here just slew a wolf. Here's something that happened quite often while I was playing. I kept forgetting that some of my forestry zones, or deforestry zones, would run out of things to cut down. Or it would, would nearly run out, I should say. I think it tells you, if there are no trees in a zone, it'll pop up saying, like, work zone has no tasks. But once it's down to, like, two, I'd rather move it to somewhere that was more densely forested so that more people will go out to forest it at once. It's more efficient that way. Basically, I wanted, like, something to flash up when a work zone was about to expire. Doesn't really matter too much. There's a look at the house. It's a bit bigger. Stuff stored inside lasts longer, so I don't know, the conditions inside are better. Maybe it's less humid and stuff. The thatching looks a bit nicer. And... It probably has more health in that it will last longer before you have to repair it. Although you can't repair it with mud, you need stone to repair it. Mud is available infinitely, stone isn't. So now the sustainability of our village is once again impacted in some way. And I was probably mad. Here's Zamnak. He was working on the wall. He's very miserable. His happiness is very low and he sort of limps away. He's just so depressed. He just doesn't know why God is telling him to build this pointless wall over there. Well, what he can do is stumble back to the village to his house. We're going to see him here going into his house and doing something and coming out happy. I think this is because there is now beer in the village. Like some houses have beer in them. He does something in there. Now his stride has vastly improved. He's like, wait a minute. I don't care that like God's making me waste my life building a wall. I can just do it while wasted and it won't seem so bad. There's Balmek, the guy who just slew that wolf, now dead in the village. If you're watching closely, he actually had a disease. So maybe fighting the wolf got him unhealthy enough that he actually died of the disease, which was something that rarely happened, as I said. Feels like it should happen more often, but that's fine. We'll get over Balmek by making this purchase from this trader. Someone's brought fishing nets as a tech to the village. So I'm like, yep, yeah, let's just trade away everything and get fishing nets. We don't really need this because, well, we don't really need fish. We don't really need food. Our meat supply is through the roof because our animal population is too large. And to support the animal population, I've been farming more and more space, which means I also happen to have more and more grain. So in tandem, we're just so food rich, we don't need any of this stuff. We don't need to work half the time, as I said. And broadly speaking, this would be a very chill, utopian village if it wasn't for the fact that we have a finite number of stones to work with, and of course for the fact people sometimes show up to kill us. 
I need to be faster with the micro here really, because now that everybody's fighting outside the walls, my grand plan of defending the inside of the gate doesn't really work very well, because the AI usually doesn't sally out of the gate automatically when it can. Sometimes it actually does, so I don't really understand how it works, but whatever. Some people will go out and finish off the enemy here. You might have noted we lost multiple people on the wall there just because the enemy kept shooting at us. We certainly didn't need to be doing that, and I don't really want it either. So this isn't a very good setup, I don't think. Another thing you might have noted is that if your people don't have bows, they still have a ranged attack because they can throw their melee weapons. Your spear has infinite ammo. That's quite handy. Actually, I don't think it's infinite. Your spear has like a health bar or a durability bar. And I think throwing it reduces its durability, but it does instantly come back to you like on a string. So if you throw it over the wall, you just get it back and you can keep throwing it. That's pretty handy. So functionally, everybody can act as a ranged soldier in combat. Very useful. Doesn't necessarily feel like it should work that way, though. My secret theory is that instead of all this wall business, we should have just built loads of gates to ensure that the enemy kind of get distracted and just want to go to the gates and then we fight them in a preset location where the fact that we have like 100 soldiers and they only have 10 means that in the spam where like everything's no clipping into each other, we'll just have more DPS and win because of that and it will be nice and efficient and simple. Well, maybe another time I'll try that. For now, we've made the breakthrough that I spent the entire game looking forward to. We have finally got some plows. There are some extra conditions to plowing you need to keep in mind. Plows can only be pulled by horses and cows, so we had to domesticate horses and cows and spend some time looking for horse and cow-like things in the environment once again to bring those in. Once you have these labour animals, you can build a plow at a workshop and use the animals to pull it around. This replaces the usual planting system, although we don't have enough plows for everybody to do it. But it also works really efficiently if your farms are set up in long strips because the plough just goes in a straight line and plants everything at once. However, a lot of my farms are kind of haphazardly put in between buildings and on gaps where we could farm things. So we've got quite a few fields that won't be very efficient to plough, unfortunately. So if I've been thinking about this or knew about it in advance, we could make a nice ploughing paradise where the fields are really boring looking and would be very quick to plant. Well, even this is an improvement. The plough allows your people to plant like five things for the labour of one person, so you're having fewer people actually do the farming. And also the person doing it doesn't lose happiness, I think. That's a big thing. They don't mind doing the ploughing because they're effectively just following behind an animal and putting the seeds in. So, things are even more utopian. We're going to be producing even more food for even less labour. People are going to be even less miserable about it. Like, our food supplies are getting out of control. You can see how small the text is becoming in the top left as it tries to display just how much meat we have. There's no way to eat the food that we have. Basically, you could say that I messed up because we're wasting labor. We're overproducing things way too much. And finally, as this fight takes place, on the left, you can see I've got the UI elements I hinted at way earlier in the video. A thing that shows you your food supply and your straw supply. So you can actually get a decent idea of how it's fluctuating year on year. And that finally allows you to work out how much of stuff you actually need. So it was straw that I was, re I was really focusing on rather than food. Because we did keep running out of straw because we have too many animals and that's why we have too much food. I wanted to rebalance it somehow and getting rid of the animals is the answer. As you can see, this battle is at the other place the enemy like to attack. There are actually many enemies here, and here on the left, one of them does actually bypass our wall. They do take advantage of that problem with our overall defensive network, but they of course do die because everyone's just hanging out here, and a huge mosh takes place. Our watchtower explodes, I don't think that kills the people inside, which is good. Overall, we just mowed them down. And I think the watchtower, like the platform, was kind of making things harder for us. Because when the enemy just charge in, they die. It's the enemy standing outside the town that provide the long-term damage effect. They're the ones who get off loads of attacks during the raid, essentially, and might actually kill you or destroy a building. So that little part of town is probably easier to defend because I've put fewer defences there. That's my theory. Well, whatever. The broad point is that our village is doing extremely well, and I would want to attack it if I was somebody else. I would be jealous. But you can also just ask me to join because I need more people. Like, I'm very generous. If you want to come and live here, 
then do it, because that's just more labour for me to waste on vanity projects. We need more of that. In this next battle, we're still suffering from success, I think, because while we've got our nice tasty open gate for the enemy to charge through, most of them seem to be interested in going for the wall over there, and I still think if I just hadn't put the wall there, maybe things would be going better. Fortunately, while many of them decide to try and get around the wall, they go around it to their left instead of their right, meaning they run right into our troops. Actually, one of their guys did go <laughs> through it to the right by the looks of things there. Well, anyway, there's a battle over that section of the wall, and here's where we really need a button that's like, just attack the enemy. We have that button to make everybody rush over to defend. We need a, an equivalent thing for attacking because the best thing to do for me DPS-wise would be to just rush them at that stage while they were standing there trying to have a shootout with our people on the wall. Well, we defeated them, but they did actually break down a section of the wall. I'm going to put it back. But again, really feels like there's some way to get around all of this. Things were better back when we didn't have any walls, but at least it looks better like this. Here's me committing more to this bit where I've put down loads of the platforms, so we're going to have lots of people defending the walls properly. We'll get more out of our people this way because fewer people are doing nothing during the battle. But it is again encouraging the enemy to stand off with us and actually do damage to us, whereas they might not do damage if they were stuck in a mosh. So a bit of micro from me is all we really need to clear this up. We have plenty of reserves and people not participating in the fight. Way more than we need to drive the enemy away. We're also benefiting from having invented armor, shields and swords. So I'm just making those in the background. I don't really need to focus on them because we're mainly using spears and bows, the stuff we've had since the start of the game, and that seems to work fine. You can spec more into more soldier-like equipment loadouts, but holding swords all the time isn't very useful for our people day to day, so I think spear and bow is probably the way to go. And would you look at that, it is now the Iron Age. What I was hoping to do was shoot through to the Steel Age right after, but it turns out you need loads of knowledge points to do that, so I'm not able to do it right away. That was really the big tech I was interested in, and while I didn't know it at the time, this proves to be a correct intuition. Getting steel instead of iron is much more important than getting iron instead of bronze. Well, we'll see that in a second. First of all, we look around and wonder where the iron is. I was distracted because there's a pig over there. Ooh. Well, no, back to business. We've all seen pigs before. What else is happening? There's some iron over here that's vaguely close to the settlement. We'll start dragging it in. After that, we make bloomeries, which are, for all intents and purposes, better fires. We've invented Fire 2.0. If you put the fire in a sort of stone enclosure and blow a ton of air into it, you get a bigger fire. And it turns out that really big fires can melt even more interesting rocks, like iron. Here was a great screen I discovered late in the game, where it tells you what exactly you need to do to get more knowledge. That's more and more important as knowledge has become more scarce. Since we've produced everything loads of times, we're not getting any more knowledge from our general economic progress or just economic cycles. So we need to do some stuff, some novel stuff, and here it tells you what exactly you can get knowledge for. So in this example, I'm looking up bloomeries and being like, well, I probably only need two but I'm going to make five because you get an extra knowledge point if you make five. So let's just do it. So here I'm like mousing around thinking, where can I put this thing? I'm probably thinking I can't be bothered to move the camera to find somewhere to put these things. So just let there be somewhere that I can build it in front of me so I don't have to do anything else here somewhere, please. Like on the mountains, that's fine. It's actually not the worst place to put them because I'm putting them effectively between the iron mines and the blacksmiths, which are some of those huts towards the bottom. So there is some utility to putting it on top of that mountain in a slightly awkward to get to looking place. But more importantly, we'll get some knowledge. You can even just delete the things after you make them if you only wanted the knowledge and they're ruining your setup to actually have them there. But I am going to keep them because we might as well make loads of iron since we can. Although that said, do we even want loads of iron? We have to ask this question again. Iron turns out to be similar to copper in that while it can be used to make various tools, they're not actually any better than the tools you have already. Going through it here, iron is generally a three-star material for a lot of the tools that have potentially four stars of quality. Bronze is also a three-star material, and we already have tons of that lying around. We've already got the bronze tools, so we don't really need the iron tools. The only thing is, because they are a commodity, you get knowledge for making them. 
so there's some value in just making them because you can, and eventually in the extreme long term because you'll run out of stuff to make bronze, you could switch to using iron without any drop in economic productivity. So that's nice, but it did make me less interested in iron. I didn't order the blacksmith to actually make anything with the iron, I'm just going to collect the iron for now. Because I'm still thinking about steel of course, and after making this trade, we do have the knowledge to go for steel because mining a bit of iron ore gives us some extra knowledge. Therefore, it's steel time. This unlocks the final tier of stuff you can make, and this time we know that it is actually a good thing to make, so we're going to order all of the steel to come through. It's as good as it gets at everything. The other thing about steel is that, economically speaking, there's no downside to steel. Like, you might think steel, well, I thought at least, like, steel is some kind of, like, alloy, quote-unquote, of iron and coal is in some way adding extra carbon to iron to make it into something slightly different. In-game, there are no additional ingredients for making steel versus making iron. Both of them just take iron ore and charcoal. So, you might as well get steel. It's a complete upgrade, like unlike the other upgrades which might not have given you anything. Here, there's no downside, you only get an upside for it. Other than that, skipping the iron tier as we're doing here means we're losing some knowledge. So what I actually did is have a couple of the bloomeries still make iron anyway, so I could manually build a few iron tools. Like if you make 10 of everything, you'll get a couple of knowledge points along the way, and that's probably worth doing. Not that we necessarily need that much knowledge anymore. We're basically at the end of the tech tree, and you don't need all the techs. Here's me grabbing one for free, quote unquote for free, without knowledge points by trading away just stuff that we had, which we clearly don't need, we've got loads of stuff, to make water mills. It's called like hydro power, the tech. So it's like, what, am I unlocking a hydroelectric power plant or something? No, just water mills, which is an interesting thing because it's another tech that reveals the lack of like another tech you might expect. It's like, oh, I've invented the water mill, but we didn't invent the ordinary mill. Like we've got donkeys and cows. We haven't got them to mill flour for us. We were still doing it with the stone age thing, like by hand with a stone. So we finally got a way to make flour a bit faster, so that will speed up the economy, that's nice. Feels like they should have thrown in an earlier Metal Age version of the same thing and just made it a little building or a little station where if you have a free labour animal, it will make flour for you as well. We are nearly done with the game, we've got the ninth milestone, which was just to have some steel, so that's easy enough. The tenth milestone, though, is what we're really aiming towards. You need 150 people and to build a cairn. The cairn is like a wonder, you could call it. It's just the hardest building to make. It's the tech at the bottom there, and it requires tons of megalith stones. And one thing you never get is a better way to deal with megalith construction. We're still kind of stuck in the Stone Age to some extent. Like, the only way to get megalith rocks to use for megalith buildings is to tie ropes around them and like roll them on logs, stuff like that. Like, we're doing this in such a Stone Age style. Guys, what is it? 7000 BC? I don't remember when the megalith stuff was actually made in real life. It feels like a long time ago. We invented like wheels, and we've got all these domesticated animals that are way stronger than us. Like, can't we somehow put the megalith rock? with some cows in front of it and drag it along like a chariot, or maybe put some wheels on those logs we keep putting underneath it to make it roll around. Those sorts of things. Unfortunately, you can't get a tech like that, so, well, I guess in terms of game design, that kind of works out, because it means having the end game objective be to make something that requires you to have loads of rocks does require a big commitment, because you're constantly sending teams of people out into the increasingly distant world to find rocks you haven't used already, and drag them really slowly back to town, which we'll see in a second. Before that, all I needed to do was get some knowledge, which at this stage essentially means waiting around. We've essentially completed the game at this stage, I'm really just managing the things that aren't quite automated, like deciding when to change the forestry zones here, and well, it would be easier if you could make a forestry zone on the areas where you have trees growing because you planted them, or to put that in a better way, to be able to cut down your own orchards. Because I don't necessarily care about getting the fruit anymore, I might want to just grow the trees, get fruit for a few years, and then cut them all down to just get a massive pile of lumber, because we might need that more, maybe we need the fuel, or maybe we're doing pointless things like adding extra bridges, which is what I was doing there. So it just feels like that's a missing option, but it also kind of has to be like that because of the 
exploitiness almost of how quickly trees that you plant grow versus regular trees. Well, that doesn't matter. Our people are down there doing some stuff. You can see the bloomeries blooming away. We're going to make tons of steel and iron ore. We're going to get really clever as a result, but not quite clever enough to realize there's probably a better way of moving a big rock than dragging it behind a rope. Soon I have unlocked the thing, the cairn. We don't have anywhere to put it, so we'll have to work that out because it's quite big as it turns out. But all we need to do now is build this thing. I ended up deleting part of the orchard in the corner to make space for it. Handily, the trees that you plant can be deleted. So while I was complaining that you can't cut them down, you can just make them disappear from reality instantly. Which is also handy in its own way, specifically right now. We've got space for the thing. We need four big rocks, 20 small rocks, and 20 bits of mud. Well, the latter two are easy enough to find. We'll have to wait for the big rocks to come in from distant locales. So here I am, out here, somewhere, looking for big rocks. We've got some people out here, clearly, who are fighting the wolves. And there are big rocks out here. And as I said, we're stuck, kind of sledding them across the landscape, which takes a long time. But I think I had actually been bringing these rocks in for a while before I needed them. So they're closer than they used to be. You can see more in the background there, highlighted blue. So we've got a whole load coming in from the same direction here. Clearly I just sort of looked out in one direction and picked those rocks because I couldn't be bothered to move the camera around the village, I expect. That's my prediction for why they're all coming at the same time. And there they are doing the dragging. It looks like it's very difficult for them to do so. It just really feels like we, as a civilization, have a better way of doing this, probably. You can have up to three people dragging, as you can see. But, you know, this logic extends out, like, why can't we have everybody drag? Why can't I have the cow drag? Can we put some wheels? And we've basically given the rock axles. We just didn't put wheels on them. Who knows? Back in the village, we're conversing with people who do know about wheels because they also know about deep mining. So I'll now trade away all of my stuff for this. And again, we have so much stuff, like in terms of resource production, we just go through the roof, like I'm not even using all the stuff we're making. One nice economy fact I discovered towards the end of the playthrough is the value of wool. Since wool is produced infinitely for free from your sheep population, and it's worth quite a lot to traders, just making way more wool than you need and trading it for everything else is a pretty decent economic strategy. Like That could be your industry as a village to be the wool village and just keep trading that away because it's worth a decent amount. You can even turn the wool into clothes and trade the clothes away, but that requires some labor and I'd rather the sheep do all the labor. Well, anyway, we've got that deep mining. What's that? This allows you to extend the amount of resources you get from mines. So it's the exact tech that somebody who was having a mental breakdown like me the other day needs. We can now get more stuff out of our holes in the ground. It's still not infinite, which was the actual cause of my breakdown. So that's a shame. But theoretically, if I was to run this village for another hundred years, we probably would still have some resources, maybe vaguely close enough that our people could get there before they die of hunger and then drag them back. You could even, if you wanted to be really cool, actually move the entire village somewhere else on the map by just rebuilding it somewhere else. But I'm sure plenty of the villagers would die in the process of walking to the new site and things like that, so I don't really want to try something like that. But theoretically, you could do that and use more of the map. Now, here we have an attack that finally, after all this time, actually decides to screw me over. Or does it? Well, we'll see. An attacking group is coming in from a direction, one of the many choices of direction they can pick, that doesn't involve attacking our defences. And this is the best place for them to attack, I think. It gets them right into the village really quickly, just going over the mountains, which we don't have any defences on. My people are gathering for the battle down there, facing a slightly different direction, and I sort of wondered, well, how is this going to go? Am I going to have to micro everybody to move them back into the village as the enemy start burning it down? Well, no, actually. You can see the enemy, while they're inside our defences, they start fighting to get back out. And I think they really want to attack that gate. It's all about the gates, so they're willing to destroy our walls to get a chance to attack the gate from the outside, despite being inside the gate. Some of them realize we're like right here and fights break out, so something happens here. And we vaguely end up getting the defensive battle we need. The enemy don't actually get into the town. And what I don't know, because the enemy never got into the town in this playthrough, is what they actually do if they get in. Like, I guess the, the, the worry I had is that they'd start a fire and like because everything's really close together and everything's very flammable, my village layout would be extremely vulnerable to being set on fire. 
I don't know, maybe they just steal objects or something. Basically, there's a whole thing where people come and attack your village, and it's really broken feeling, is the ultimate conclusion. Well, they run off after failing to <laughs> utilize their strategic advantage. Meanwhile, back in the village, we've got two of the rocks there, so the cairn is coming along. We really just have to wait here and hope things go okay. This is a really chill time at this late stage in the game, because... Everything we need is just going to come to us with time, and the village is so economically stable that nothing bad can really happen. Looks like I decided to do something about that possible attack vector. I'm putting a gate up here in the mountainous area, and walling the area off as well, which probably doesn't matter that part, but might as well do it anyway. We've got loads of stones and people to do stuff. So if they were to attack here again, there'd be a closer gate for them to fight over. And as we just saw, that probably wouldn't make any practical difference. Back over at the cairn, we eventually get the stones and our people start arranging them strategically to make our thing. It's a pile of stones, a pile of mud with a corridor in the middle. That's a great place to put a skeleton and our people are really going to enjoy that. The only thing is, we actually don't have 150 people anymore. You might remember that was also the goal to finish the campaign. And at some point we lost a few people. We had a couple of casualties in raids and people just die of old age randomly. So you can't really control what your population is specifically. We have enough housing to have a higher population, but people aren't showing up for us at the moment. However, building this cairn is to some extent going to alleviate that because it adds to your village's prestige and in some way what your population can be is linked to your prestige but I think also your prestige is linked to your population something something I don't understand that mechanic the point is we did build the wonder there's the prestige we need some more I guess to max that out and make people really want to come and visit our village we would have completed the game right now if I had a higher number. So once again, we just have to wait. And this time we're really just hoping that people show up a little bit faster than they're dying off of old age or random chance or things like that. And to get prestige, the general method, I think anyway, is to just have lots of buildings. So what I thought was I'll build loads of pointless buildings all over the place, which is why you see my people here building random totem poles near the cairn. But I actually don't think it works like this in retrospect. Right at the end, after I built loads of things, I started to notice my prestige wasn't really going up. Because while each building has a prestige score attached to it, I think it only counts once for each type of building. I'm not completely sure about that, obviously, but making loads of buildings may not actually do anything to your village's prestige. It's just having lots of different types of buildings. So maybe there's something I didn't build somewhere. Also, I think you get prestige for just unlocking techs, and possibly I think you get prestige for having people. But prestige's mechanical use is to get people as well, so I don't know how that <laughs> mixes out in the end. Something, something. We eventually do sort of trickle up to 150 at some random point, and there it is. We have completed the game. Well, I say completed the game. What completing this campaign does is unlock the other campaigns. That's what your milestones do. You kind of cash them in to unlock other game modes. You might notice that one frame after we completed the game, we actually went back down to 149. So like just for a moment, we had completed it and now we're back out again. But that will probably solve itself eventually. Having the cairn should mean we get more immigration to the town because there's more prestige. Quote unquote should mean. I like to believe that's what it means. But as I just talked about, I actually don't even know. What I'll probably do is tell my people that I know what's going on while secretly not knowing what's going on. And they'll say that I'm a very wise god and such, and it will all look pretty good for us. So more time passes, and we more convincingly now have met the victory objectives. I'm actually still playing, though, because I wanted to make another cairn. This was me thinking. A cairn gives you 100 prestige, that's what it said. And I need about 100 prestige to get full prestige. I wanted to get full prestige, so I thought I'll just make another one. There's probably some more rocks around. And you might note I built loads of random totem poles and flags and just misc all over the village here and there, which you might see. And I was kind of thinking that if I build like 50 flags and a flag's worth one prestige point, I'll get 50 prestige. 
no, I'm pretty sure it doesn't work like that, and that's how I came to know that, essentially, because I eventually did make all these things, and it didn't seem to make much difference to our prestige. In the meantime, we get attacked from another novel direction, this gate in one corner that was pretty much forgotten up by the Ken. Where the defences weren't very good, because it was so forgotten, the wall doesn't actually <laughs> cover the whole area. Well, that doesn't make too much difference again, and I think this is just proving the point, where your defence quality doesn't need to matter, it's just that there are some defences there at all to make the enemy focus down that point for their attack. Now, a while later, it looks like those defences in the back there have now been expanded upon, but more importantly, I had noticed my prestige wasn't really going up over time. So... Maybe I should have cottoned on that making another cairn wasn't a good idea, but I decided to do it anyway. So we have actually completed the game, and now all I have is some more footage of me doing the objective to complete the game again, hoping it would complete the game even more. There's probably an achievement for maxing up prestige. I tried to get it, didn't get it. Somebody in the comments tell me what exactly should I do in this situation to get it, because I was curious. And that is the end of Dawn of Man. When I first started playing Dawn of Man, I remember thinking, this is going to be rubbish. Like, I kind of picked it, as I said in the beginning, just because it's a game that's not a sci-fi space adventure game of some kind, because like all the other games I have installed right now to play are that kind of game. So I played this thinking, it'll just be a break. But once I started playing it, I was like, you know what? I actually am interested in this, and I think this is a really good concept for a city builder or village builder of some kind. It's only that I don't think it goes far enough, like what I wanted from Dawn of Man is something more about the Dawn of Man, stuff that includes more Stone Age things. This is similar to my commentary I made on that beaver city builder, where I was like, I kind of like it, but it should be more about beavers. Same thing here, I kind of like a Stone Age city builder, but it should be more about Stone Age stuff. I want to domesticate bees and stuff. There should be more flint or whatever I was having a breakdown about earlier. I kind of liked where it started going in all of these different directions. I just feel like it needs to go further. So essentially, I want to see Dawn of Man 2. I want to see this with a higher budget, with more stuff. I want to see a cultural, societal aspect added in. What I don't know is how easy that would be to actually fit into how the game's economy works. Like, that's the big reason where if you told me to design that game, I'd be like, well, that's difficult because the entire game at the moment is based around that not being a factor and it requires it to not be there. So I don't know if there's a good way to make it so that your people... I don't know, value singing songs in some way, and you as the player are like, yes, my people have a more advanced language than the people down the river. That means I'm winning. And it's not just like, well, my people, for some reason, are spawning dogs out of their houses. That's useful, I guess. Who knows? The whole idea of actually interacting with other villages is probably another massive expanse you could go into for having a really refreshing and new sort of civilization building experience almost, set in prehistory where games don't normally go there, making it a nice fertile ground to just have stuff and show people what it used to be like in the bad old days, as far as we know. When society, when life was a bit different, when you just had to do whatever Devin said, those were the good old days, sometimes he got you killed, a lot of the time he was very mean about you and sort of patronises you for being so impressed that you've managed to melt a rock in a fire and things like that. But in the end, didn't he guide us to a glorious new future? Look at how many resources we're not using up in the top left. In a different game, that would make us very powerful. Like, if we could then trade en masse with another city-state and become their overlords or something because we're so rich. Something, something, imagining a better game than this. But when I say better, I don't really want to denigrate Dawn of Man either because it's not like there was a blueprint for how to do this. I think Dawn of Man is like a door of man to a new world of games that are about starting civilization, about getting to the point when other games would usually start paying attention to things and let you play. The stuff that happened before that, the stuff that was 99% of human history, as I said, or whatever percentage it is, it's probably more than that, actually. The Stone Age lasted a real long time. There were, like, five different species of human that came and went in the Stone Age until, like, the main one took over everything towards the end. What happened to those other guys? Can we throw them into the game? Let's go even further back. I mean, this game supposedly 
starts in something like 15,000 BCE, but it's like that's not even really the Stone Age, right? Like the Stone Age was like 750,000 <laughs> BCE. Like we could go way further back. I feel like you could even have that be a gameplay thing. Like my whole domestication rants from earlier where you're like creating a new species, that would to some extent apply to you as well because humans are being domesticated <laughs> by themselves in that they are adapting to their environment. So for example, because we're supposed to be in Europe of some kind, like towards the end we sort of looked like we were Nordic in some way, maybe earlier we looked African and we evolved to become white over time because like your disease rate was higher when you had darker skin, things like that. I don't know, things that really happened, like humans kind of changed a fair bit. If I, if I vaguely remember correctly, and you can correct me when I'm wrong, isn't pale skin and blonde hair, like being a Nordic or Northerner, as our people are sort of portrayed to be, like a Northern European. That's like a really recent survival adaption, as far as I know. And I am from the past, obviously, so I know everything about the past. I don't know, it feels like within the time span that Dawn of Man takes place in, those sorts of adaptions would take place. But then this also opens up the question of like, well, is it really an adaption? Or is it just because like, we were outcompeted by an invading population? Like, your original population in Dawn of Man would be subsumed into a new population of immigrants which are of a different ethnicity because I think that is actually how it happened if I vaguely remember how the Stone Age went. I think like pale skin was a mutation that came from like the East, like the Middle East or something and it outcompeted the Europeans and created white people. At some point white people were invented. That should be a tech in Dawn of Man alongside singing bees, cats. We should be inventing all of these things in Dawn of Man and at some point I think our people should invent being able to speak to each other as well and maybe being able to speak to other people off map. There are many things you could do with a really old simulation of what humanity was getting up to and how humanity wasn't even necessarily one species back in the day and somebody do that right now. I thought I wasn't going to like Dawn of Man I liked it more than I thought I was going to, and even though I complained the entire time, I would love to see this be taken further. And I would also quite like to play Dawn of Man again, and that's a rare thing I say about games. It has enchanted me in some abstract way. I'm going to give it my I would play it a second time stamp of approval, which I actually only do now and again on this channel. This is a genuinely rare honour. You did a good job, Dawn of Man, despite me complaining about every single aspect as usual. This is a I'm complaining because I love it situation which I occasionally invoke to excuse the fact that I love complaining about things. And that's Dawn of Man. Thank you for watching this commentary. Next up, well, we'll probably be going into some sort of sci-fi thing. In fact, I remember what I started playing right after this. Like, I actually know what I did in my real life. I don't even have to speculate on what I did in the past. I actually do remember what happened like two days ago. I started playing Okay, it's Devin from the future here cutting in. You probably thought I actually did remember what I played next. I was wrong. I originally said I originally said that I played Warhammer 40k Mechanicum, that game. No, that is not what that's literally not what happened. The next game I played was Homeworld, Deserts of Karak. So that's the next commentary I'm going to make. I also started playing that other thing recently and you know it caused confusion you know I, I don't remember what happened to me even though I just claimed that I did because you know when you're as old as me when you're literally a homo erectus who remembers everything that happened <laughs> since those times with perfect accuracy it's very difficult to uh, correctly speak and obviously I feel compelled to keep speaking despite having nothing to say because that is my purpose on this earth. Thanks for watching this commentary once again. I thought Dora Man was uh, d decent. Goodbye. <laughs>